Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest. From the racing world with their stories, their paths, their their racing racing roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and their YouTube channel. Also on JerseyCapeYachts.com. Check out my website, dhamiam.com. Be sure to hit that subscribe, turn on the bell notification, so you'll be notified every time we go live. Now here's our host, David Ham. All right, hey everybody, welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. And tonight I got my extra special, special guy guest, uh, what's your name again? Matt Ashbrenner. How's it going, brother? I was getting ready to say hash because that's what I'm used to calling you. That's like, okay. Every time. A lot of your listeners know, don't don't well, know that we've worked together before in here. Yes, we did. Uh, about maybe close to four years. There might be extra banter tonight. Per near, yeah. Yeah, I told you some of the things you can't say that you normally would say, but that don't mean you're not going to say them. I will saying. do my best. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, uh, Matt Ashbrenner, also known as Hash, who worked in NASCAR for 16 years, and you traveled most of those years, I would say. Or oh, I, I was an early crew every mm-hmm. every year for that deal. Yeah. yeah. So, and we kind of overlapped in our careers, but uh, we're going to let Hash, he's going to tell his story tonight. And I also got over here, not to forget Phil. I like the added there's camera. The, there's the Phil cam. Yeah. Good oh, evening. I, guess I, uh, I think this is going to be interesting with you two. I didn't. I didn't catch on to tonight about the banter. It's going to be good. I think oh, yeah. you met your match tonight, David. Yeah, well, we're <laughs> we're kind of used to that, but usually it's him saying something to me, and then I just kind of chuckle. Well, I was going to say, I, hopefully your usual listeners yeah. don't get butt hurt when I when I either make fun of you or say make a joke about it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yes, because it's all in good fun. Yeah. We've been together for a long time. Yeah, that's right. We're good friends. Thanks yep. for having me on. This is cool. Yeah, we're literally like you said, brother. We're like brothers. We're like brothers, but a different mother and dad. much different. So. Yeah, which, by the way, my folks are listening. A lot of families listening too. So, hey, everybody, what's up? My brother uh, and his family are listening on the TV. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Noah. Very cool. And he worked in NASCAR as well. For he a did. Long. He did. He did. And but he did a um, what did you call it? Rowdy Burns. He pulled a Rowdy Burns. He uh, won the championship with Stuart Haas Racing, and then uh, came back and put the house on the market and moved to Indiana. Became a farmer. Mm-hmm. How about that? Mm-hmm. Can't blame him for that, though. I mean, heck no. <laughs> especially you know, the way things are right now. So he became a uh, farmer and a dad. So that's, oh, okay. a, that's a bonus. Okay. Farmer and a Dale. What is a Dale anyway? Huh? Farmer and a Dale. I don't know, man. I always wondered that. Can we but, break uh, down that song and yeah, <laughs> we could figure that out? So, yes, Liquid Larry and, uh, of course, like Kathy, do they still go by that? Or? Yeah, on, a, on a good night, yeah. Okay. <laughs> on a good Which night. brings me to the beginning of, of yeah. how I got started. Uh, I was conceived after a really good bowling game. Oh, yeah. They told me. How'd that go? <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't there. That was yeah. Gutter ball. Gutter ball. You don't remember that? I think it was a really good series Gutter is what ball. my mom said. <laughs> it must have been. It must have been a winning night or sympathy. Anyway, yeah. So <laughs> I shouldn't say that. It might have been. Uh, yeah. So right now my dad is saying, geez, <laughs> but they're uh, they're trying to keep warm right now. Don't tell me how, mom and dad, because uh, it's been in the single digits in mm-hmm. Iowa for the past like 14 days or something like that. Yeah. And they've just gotten snowfall after snowfall after snowfall. <laughs> It's like, man. Uh, and they're staying up there. Yeah. So I was born and raised in northeast Iowa, mm-hmm. uh, about, uh, I guess, an hour west of Dubuque. Um, and uh, in the town of Waterloo, where John Deere Tractors was invented. Oh, yeah. And that's a good song, too. It is. Stonewall Jackson song. I was born in Waterloo. Waterloo. New York. Ah. Yeah. Were you Waterloo. really? Yeah. How about yeah. that? Yeah. That's pretty cool, Phil. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Um, and uh, my dad was a wholesale florist, and my mom was a nurse. Your dad was a wholesale a wholesale florist. That means he supplied all the smaller places, like like a John, like he would have been the supplier for Johnson's Greenhouse, okay, and all those other places here in town. Yeah, but anyway, so he uh, he worked really long hours, typically doing that. And uh, like I said, mom was a nurse, and um, I grew up and um, and really didn't know anything about racing. Didn't I didn't know anything at all. Had no mechanical skills or abilities at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, so. I was actually going to school to 
in high school t- taking classes to be a doctor or be in medicine. I wanted to be a general surgeon. I wanted to cut people. Oh, yeah. Some things never change. You always had that knife on you, and you always pointed at me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll cut you. Yeah. I won't, right. I won't think twice. Too, yes. Never knowing when you have so. to do emergency tracheotomy on somebody. Right. Because exactly. they're choking in their throat. So now I know what you mean when you say that. I'll cut you. And okay. you always usually have some alcohol with you, too, to clean the knife, I'm saying. No, I mean to clean the knife off, you know. <laughs> evidence. That's clean evidence. It's not rubbing alcohol. Just because it's really. Sailor Jerry doesn't mean anything. Oh, that stuff is so good. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so. Good gracious. But, but anyway. But there's no NASCAR tracks up there. Well, know, there's Iowa. dirt. Most of it's on dirt. Okay. You got Farley, Iowa. Iowa, Independence, Iowa. Um, corn. You, there's a, yeah, yeah. there's a corn. racetrack down in Cedar Rapids. Uh, there was some, there was some quarter mile stuff uh, yeah. in my area, yeah. but we never really went to that stuff. Oh, I forgot Vinton. Vinton is another one, hmm. but I, we never really went to these places. Uh, I went to races when I was a kid. Uh, my dad was into old cars. Uh, he got back from serving during Vietnam and bought a brand new 70 Dodge Challenger and we still have it. He still has it. Uh, so I grew up going to car cruises when I was a kid and I just absolutely loved old cars, you know, yeah. um, of all makes and models. Um, so that was my really, my, my biggest exposure to cars. Uh, we had three wheelers and four wheelers, of course. And I, and I love to go fast everywhere I went. I had a, I had a snowmobile yeah. and love to go fast on that thing. No matter what I had it pinned every time. If I was on my 10 speed bicycle, I was going as fast as I could wherever I went, but I really never made the correlation with, Hey, I like to go fast and race and all that. Mm-hmm. So the whole thing in high school was I was taking, um, biology, anatomy and physiology, physics, chemistry, all these classes to gear me up towards going to medical school, which probably would have been at the university of Iowa. And then, um, my best friend, Jim, we, and we have been best friends since preschool and we still are, and he's mm-hmm. still back home, but his dad was a doctor, but he was kind of a gearhead. And so Jim and I would help him, uh, you know, p- either put in a motor, take it out, work on cars, trucks. And that was really my, the beginning of my exposure. And then as a reward for helping him, he took us to a race in Michigan. Okay. And that was my first, it was a bush race. Uh, um, we sat in row 35, just past the start finish line. And I was absolutely blown away. Yeah. I went down and I stood right next to the fence, mm-hmm. you know, um, saw my first Hooters girl. <laughs> That's that right. Cause there aren't so any in you, Iowa. Well, oh, there weren't okay. at the time. Yeah. And yeah. if there were, it was, I mean, nobody knew about it. I think there might've been one in Des Moines, but I don't even know. So that, but, that kind of led you, and I know I'm not going to get into that part yet, but that led you into two of your career choices. So anyway, that'll come Kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I went to that race, and uh, when we came back, I it was like an eight-hour drive, I suppose, mm-hmm. back to Iowa. And when I got there, um, instead of going to bed right away, I stayed up and I watched Days of Thunder three times in a row. Wow. Like legit. Like the sun was coming up. My parents came down. Hey, did you have a good trip? I'm like, I haven't been to bed. And it was it was really about that. You know, the best part about was listening to Rowdy Burns go around the racetrack all by himself at Charlotte, you know, when it, when pit wall was a guardrail. Yeah. yeah. And it was just like I would crank it up and I would hear, turn it down. But anyway, so uh, that following Monday morning, I, uh, I dropped chemistry and I took auto mechanics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I started to learn how to, to work on things. You know, and the first uh, thing I rebuilt was a one cylinder Briggs and Stratton motor. Oh, yeah. The five horsepower Briggs. Exactly right, you know? Yeah. And then the goal was to take it all the way apart and then put it all the way back together, and you had to fire it up. So you're talking about Days of Thunder. Now, I, when I was in college, uh, my best friend in college. Whoa, bought, I was you went at, to college? I was at Central Piedmont in, in Charlotte, so I was taking automotive stuff to learn how to work on cars because I wanted to get into NASCAR, and I wanted to get in so bad. One of my friends there bought me Days of Thunder, and so I was – it's the same way. I was hooked. I already wanted to get into NASCAR, and I'd already been – hanging around at like Concord Speedway but I loved that movie and that was what really drove me to uh, was wanting to get into that so you'd never actually saw it in the theater David you waited no I didn't guy no, I, Man, was, I didn't, I, I didn't as either. soon as it came out I yeah. was at the theater that well, I didn't know just, about it you know what oh, I mean it was oh, it wasn't a hook nah, for me I thought nah. that IRL racing was probably gonna be pretty cool oh you young kids I couldn't afford to go to <laughs> theaters I mean back yeah, then sure. yeah that's yeah. why it was, a, it was well, a, yeah for you it was yeah. beer or theater and you can't right. have both at once so. yes it was a present from my rich friend <laughs> yeah. A D, a, yeah i still got it, a vhs movie that's cool so, probably yes. still have a vcr too yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> it's yeah, set right now yeah. yeah i will tell you this my mom yeah. asked me she says why 
did you want to be a doctor? And I said, because all your friends are set. They can buy whatever they want. They can do, you know, they've got lake houses, they got boats, they got, you know, all that stuff. Um, and so she says, you really need to find something that you like doing. Don't do something for the money. Right. And so when I came home and I told her, told them that that's what I wanted to do, then there was no, you know, question about it. It was like, go for it. So dropping chemistry and taking up auto mechanics like that. And, and the other thing too, is that, you know, in the Midwest, when you're in racing in the Midwest, you're basically going to be doing all those short track races, uh, in that area, you know, you don't necessarily know somebody down here, you know, and, and the, right, and the yeah. thing is, is what we were always told back then was you have to know somebody. You yeah. have to know somebody to get in or else you're not going to get in. Right. You I, know, I was told that a lot myself. And if you send and I was also told that if you send a resume from out of state, they just throw it in the trash until your address says NC. Yeah, that was, it was that way for a long time, I would say. And then I remember when it started shifting to where when if somebody wants to get in racing that bad and they'll move from another state, then we'll hire them. I think well, that Larry came, Pollard was a good example of that, you know, because wasn't yes. he living out in California yeah. and when uh, Richard Childers called him? So that was a good example of that. I think if they were looking for specialists, they were willing to move somebody too at that point, you know. Right. They were looking further than just local. They were looking for a particular type of person that was fitted for that position. Yeah. I was uh, a senior in high school, and everybody was telling me, you know, if you get into racing, if you do this, whatever. And I was would correct them and say, when I yeah. get into racing. Right. When. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here. And, my, uh, uh, my brakes instructor at Central Piedmont said, well, you know, that's uh, he's wanted to stand up in class the first day of class and – explain why why are you here what are you doing this class for what do you know i said because i want to get into nascar and he's like well you know you have to know somebody and it's really hard to get in you have and you it, it may take a long time i'm like i'm going to get in no matter what yeah i didn't care what anybody told me yeah i absolutely did Same not here. care in, fa in fact when i um my first car was a 79 monte carlo and uh it had a 305 motor in it and i wanted a 350 and my dad said that there is no way that i was going to get a 350 engine as, as long as the motor and the Monte Carlo was running. So I ran it out of oil and blew it up <laughs> <laughs> and then bought a 350 engine out of a 76 Laguna and then yeah. took it to school and my auto mechanics teacher. Now you're going to love this. My auto mechanics teacher, no kidding. His name was Kenny Rogers. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Swear the to God, Kenny that was Rogers. his name. Yeah. No, not the Kenny Rogers, but his name was Kenny Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Uh, okay. And uh, so he gave me a VHS tape on how to rebuild a, 350 small block engine and it was narrated by scooter brothers from uh clevite scooter brothers scooter brothers you should know who this guy is yeah what was his uh, first name you remember scooter yes did you hear me it was scooter <laughs> not his that was brother a trick question <laughs> <laughs> scooter i think it's on his birth certificate check it out so anyway yes. i watched that video m over and over again but i was able to rebuild an engine by myself i i, I worked in a restaurant as a um as a dishwasher at first and then as a line cook, but I took every single paycheck and I put it in that engine. Mm, yeah. You know, I bought new TRW pistons, you know, a new camshaft and um, Camaro springs. You know, I'm like, I want this thing to go fast. I want it mm -hmm. to scream, right? Yeah. And I sunk a lot of money into it. At the time, for me, it was a lot of money. And uh, we ended up taking the car and the engine over to my grandfather's garage um, behind Cadillac Lanes, and we put that in in, uh, in a weekend. And okay. the very first time mm -hmm. that we fired it up, it, it or tried to fire it up, it it started, you know, and it, we didn't have any exhausts on it, so it sounded like a race car. Um, I go, I want to give credit to one of the racers back home, Louis Chip, uh, from Chip Racing, and he was there to help me get it started as well. Um, and that thing was so awesome. I just, mm. I was so excited about it. There, we have a six lane thoroughfare through town right yeah and i got up on there and i just opened it up as far as i could go and in the monte carlo it's a square speedometer and the needle goes all the way around and then it hits the gear shift selector and that thing was resting up against it and i could take the play of the gear shifter and make it bounce <laughs> like this. and it was just like it started to get the death wobble in the front uh, yeah sure <laughs> i went through tires like crazy yeah. but um I want. I just. I wanted to go racing, right? That's so, funny um, you said that about your car, because first time, my first dirt track car was one that a kid wanted a new car, so he set the interior on fire, so his dad sold that car to me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was, 
But, uh, yeah, I guess it works. I never tried that, though. Yeah, destroy <laughs> so. the car you don't want just so you can get what you do want. <laughs> That's yeah. right, yes. I got. Uh, um, I had a stack of college applications on the table, and my mom basically shoved them in front of me. She says, listen, you need to fill these things out, figure out what you're going to do. I'm tired of them being on the table. Yeah. My parents were hard on me. Oh, yeah. It sounds like it, yes. <laughs> Chris is, my brother Chris is nodding right now. <laughs> now He's like, um, not hard enough. But there was this little postcard. Yeah. There was a little bitty postcard in there from Nashville Auto Diesel College. College I'd never heard before, but it's in Tennessee. And so I thought, well, I'll fill it out and send it in. And yeah. I did. And that was like the really the the only college recruiter that, that showed up at the house to actually talk to me about it. And um, turns out Eddie Lanier had gone there. Okay. Um, and then another uh, another guy in in the garage, and I can't remember his name now because I'm on the spot. But he had really really cu- curly hair. Waddell Wilson. Thank you, Waddell Wilson went yeah. there as well. So I thought, you know, knowing those two guys is th- they're. Uh, Angie they're, knew Angie knew uh, Kenny Rogers, so that worked out good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, moving to Nashville. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> yes. So um, uh, once uh, I figured out those two guys went there, we went down there and toured the school. Yes. I was like, this is where I want to do. It was a very thorough school. It lasted a year, but you had 10 days to learn about every aspect of the automobile, the truck, whatever it was. You had 10 days, nine days to learn about it, and 10 day, 10th day was the, was the phase test. And I graduated with a 96 average in perfect attendance while working 40-some hours a week at Hooters, downtown Nashville. So on there's Second the Avenue. Hooters uh, I yeah. mentioned earlier. So. <laughs> I'm no dummy. Yes. Yeah. But I made great money there. Yeah. You know, I did. Sure. It was it was right there on downtown. There was a lot of tourists <laughs> that always came in there. Mm-hmm. Got to meet uh, Mark Chestnut and Tra- uh, Marty. No, no. Travis Tritt. Okay, cool. But um, so that was a really cool time being down there for a year. Now, once I graduated, I moved back to Iowa for a few months. Got a job at a dealership. Basically moved back for a girl. That was dumb. But anyway, it so happens. Then, yeah. You know I what I mean? I do. I get it. But I worked at a, a Chevy yes. dealership in Iowa City. Uh, and I think I worked there for maybe eight or nine months, I think. And then I decided to move to Kansas City. And I got a job at a place called Superior Chevrolet. And when I was in the interview with the service manager, he had a picture of the 300 cars. It was Terry's car, Ricky Craven's car, and Jeff's car. All right there and i said i said oh you a race fan and he says well i ought to be mr hendrick owns this dealership and i was thinking oh my gosh yeah yes here's your sign i'm thinking god is leading me in the right direction yeah thank you so much prayer answered even though i'm just at a dealership that mr hendrick owns you know i'm thinking all right i'm working my way in right. about i want to say eight or nine months after working there now, this is a big Chevy dealership. It's huge. The parts department's an acre in size. All the parts guys are on roller skates. There's um, 38 technicians with 42 bays. Yep. It is a big dealership. That is big. Really that's, big. That's a lot. That's uh, like four times the size of any of them that I worked at. Yep. Uh, shout out to everybody in Kansas that's listening to, by the way. Um, but I worked in, it was in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, which is a, a, a suburb of, of Kansas City. And about 10 months after working there, Mr. Hendrick flew in just to visit, right? Yep. And they cleared the service drive. They brought in a bunch of barbecue. We had lunch in there. And then everybody got in line to meet the man. And they all had, well, they all had hats and postcards and die casts and all that stuff. Yeah. And when it, be, when it was my turn, I had nothing. And, and that was my goal. And he's like, he goes, do you, do you have anything for me to sign? And I said, no, sir. I said, I want to know what it's going to take to get into motorsports. And I said, I said, and if I don't work for you, I'm going to come up to you in the garage. And I'm going to tell you that I made it. All right. And I said, and I'm in, and you're going to wish that you hired me. Yeah. You're going to wish that you did. <laughs> yeah. That's I what I that. told him. Uh-huh. And he goes, uh-huh. okay. So he gave me a couple names of people to look up, uh-huh. you know, uh, and back then this was before the interwebs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So I had to get real creative with how, I mean, I was using like four one one and calling motorsports and trying to find out yeah. what their extension was and trying to call them and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Um, I ended up going to Talladega that year and meeting up with Andy Graves and the Budweiser team. And, I, before that I had tried to, to, to get a pit pass or whatever. And I was told that there was one there. It fell through. Oh, man. So just by talking to people and being nice and being humble, I was able to actually work my way all the way into the garage and get in there and work yeah. with the 25 guys. Right. And that's where I met, um, not, um, which Colts back did you have in Kenny? I had Keith. Okay. So I'm, so Keith Colts yeah. was, uh, was on the 25 car. And um, 
So I got to work with those guys. They made me a gas runner on race day. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was crazy. They gave me a and uniform. They gave me yeah, a headset. Just you know? put this shirt on and yeah. just do what we tell you to do. Now, and this is when Mr. Hendrick was under house arrest mm. and also fighting leukemia at the time. Yeah. So we're standing on pit road before the national anthem. The Budweiser crew's to my left. Papa Joe Hendrick pushes me to the left and, and stands right to my right. And Rick had... Mr. Hendrick, sorry, Rick. Mr. Hendrick had a, a radio system where he could be at his house in Charlotte and talk to all the teams, all his teams. Sure. So on our headsets, his voice comes on there and says, hey, Budweiser crew, just wanted to tell you to have a great day and uh, everybody be safe out there, okay, and bring home a win. And then Papa Joe gets on there and goes, Rick, we'll do our best out here, buddy. You just take care of yourself. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God. National anthem, Budweiser crew. I got Papa Joe Hendrick next to me. Rick's in my ears. Jets are flying over. This was awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was still not on a team. Right. Not in racing. Yeah. I got back in my car, drove back. Now, listen, I, went, I was making pennies, man. I was not making much money at all. And I got all the way back to Kansas City with like a dollar left. Yeah. That was it. You ran into Abby Spoon Lady out there? <laughs> <laughs> no. Can I borrow some money? No, maybe I should have taken a train. <laughs> that would have been cool. Yes, it would. Yeah. So months went by. I was still working at the dealership, and I was just like, man. I, I, and then I actually, money was so tight that I got a second job at the Hooters in Kansas City. <laughs> Couldn't right? stay away from the Hooters. Well, I knew the menu, right? So it right. was kind of easy work, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm on my way to work on a Sunday morning, and the American Top 40 country was on the radio. <laughs> And the DJ was talking about Trace Atkins, how he was upset because he couldn't get into country music, right? He was a, I think he was a, a, an old red guy or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. he was, he was, you know, in the in in an industry or something like that. Anyway, so mm-hmm. he was mad, and either his brother or his cousin, whatever, said, "Look, if you want to be on Broadway, you got to move to New York. If you want to be an actor, you need to move to Hollywood. If you want to be in country music, you need to move to Nashville." And hand on the book, the next car that passed me on the left, I mean, right away, mm-hmm. had North Carolina plates on it. Oh, there you go. Mm-hmm. So there's and another like, sign. Oh my gosh! So I turned the radio off. I rolled this down my window. Draft. Dude, no, I, in fact, what I did was I rolled my window down, I looked up at the sky, and I said, I got it. Yeah. And I went to work, and I put my two weeks' notice in. Oh, good for you. Yeah, yeah. man. And then yeah. I loaded up my 89 Chevy Cavalier with everything I owned, and I drove from Kansas City all the way to Mooresville. What was that, 94? Nine, no, no, it was 98. January 20th of 98, I landed in Mooresville, didn't have a place to live, didn't have a, didn't have a job. Nothing. I just pulled off at the Exxon station at exit 36 and I grabbed an apartment finder. I ended up in a furnished apartment right outside of Wright Field in the baseball diamonds in downtown Mooresville, right along the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then, shocking as it is, I got a job at Hooters on Independence. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Imagine that. Stick with what you know. It's the last one I worked at, by the way. (laughs) Okay. So So far. So I was driving from Mooresville all the way down to Southeast Charlotte. Yeah. And here's the deal. On my first day of getting a job at Hooters. I looked out across uh, Independence there. You know what dealership is right across the road? Rick Hendrick. City Chevrolet. Yep. Rick Hendrick, City Chevrolet. Yep. I thought that was a myth. I thought it was just a sticker they put on a car. I had no idea that he owned a place called City Chevrolet. Yeah, see, yeah. And back to whenever I was wanting to get in a NASCAR, I was working at a dealership not too far, almost across the street. That big gold building down there, you could see Oh, yeah, see yeah, with it the from, shiny windows? Yes. Mm-hmm. I could see it from out the window at the dealership where I worked. It was at Hunter, and then it was Reed Oldsmobile. Mm-hmm. So anyway, but that was years before I left there in 94, thereabouts. That's cool. I had all these little bitty signs that were telling me that I was in the right direction, you know? And I didn't have anything that was holding me back. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't married, didn't have any kids, none of that. So I was very, very career-focused and career-minded. And like, I was just pushing everything to the wayside. It didn't matter what, what was yeah. going on. This is where I'm going. And until I get it. That's what I'm focused on. You kept hearing your ear clear. Oh, my gosh. Go. Obviously, uh, Rick I Hendricks. He- I kept hearing that engine going down yeah. the back straightaway at Charlotte in oh, Days yeah. of Thunder, you know? Yes, for sure. I'd say him always, uh, he would put, load up his uh, Suburban with other people that he was trying to kind of wine and dine, I guess, and driving them around. Mm-hmm. Like there might be like uh, Japanese folks in there or whatever, <laughs> riding around town. And I was like, there's, yes, making some business deals in that Suburban. Wow. I never heard that one before. Yes. Yeah, so, um, what's the SC Pyro, South Carolina Pyro? That's uh, anyway. He says the nice, uh, nice camera angles. Thank you, Rachel Robbins down in Charlotte. Brett Troutman. What's up to the Troutman family? What's up, fire department? And and uh, I said might be station one. They're warming the guys. 
and Don Clark. <laughs> and let's see, we had some questions. Steve Knight was mentioning that uh, Paul is Scooter Brothers owner owner of Comp Performance Group. Competition cams, that's right. Yeah. Exactly right, not go. Clevite. He was competition cams. Tracy says, tell Matt I said hello. Hello back. Keystone Corner, exactly what I keep saying. Anyway, they're going on coffee. Jim Dooley's up in Virginia. Remember Jim Dooley? He's the proprietor of the Dooley Monkey. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Scott Trevis is Just down don't in spank Florida. It. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. What's up, Scott? Paul Rodriguez in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Hola. Yep. And Steve Baker. You remember Steve Baker? Yep. He said air conditioning and mail strip or something like that. Whoa. So, uh, and Random. somebody said you was rocking the uh, shorts and the, oh, with Jennifer Jolly. Said you was rocking the orange shorts and uh and the tank top. <laughs> mm. I don't think you were quite doing that. And now they're a little uncomfy nowadays. Maybe they're uncomfy. I mean, I'll leave it to Bubba to do that during the <laughs> oh yes the hunks and heels contest. <laughs> uh, Melissa Marion says, "Hey guys, howdy howdy." Uh, oh Cole, I think Cole is listening. So hello, oh Cole. yeah, what's up Cole? So got that harmonica. So anyway, back to your story. So obviously working at a restaurant, you have days off. And uh, what I did was every time I was uh, off, I would take my resume and I would go to all the race teams. I would go through all the tr teams on the truck series. I would go through all the Bush series teams. I would go through the cup series and I also go through the ARCA teams. And I'm like, if I just keep on, if I, if I give my, my resume out, maybe somebody will grab it. But then I was thinking, you know what? It's just another resume in, in, in the stack, right? So then I would just rotate and come right back and start all over again. I just kept on doing that. I kept on doing that until they started to recognize my face and my motivation, I guess. Persistence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, because I got to hang out with Andy Graves and the 25 guys down in Talladega, Andy had switched to the 5 Kellogg car with Terry Labonte. So I went up there, and along with Keith, too. So I went up there and hung out with those guys um, one day. You know, of course, there's a roped-off area that you can't cross in the race shop. And so I just stood there, and I hung out until Andy had time to come out and chat. And um, we talked for a little bit, and he goes, look, he goes, I got a couple options for you. He can go, you can go over and talk to Bill Venturini. Uh, he's got an ARCA team. His son drives the car. He says, you can go check out that. Um, and he gave me the address. He told me where it was. And he says, also, he goes, there's a driving school here in town called High, uh, Fast Track High Performance Driving School. And Andy Hillenberg owns that. That's right. And I knew who Andy Hillenberg was because he's a sprint car racer and also mm -hmm. a cup racer at the time. And um, so I went over to Venturini Motorsports um, and put my resume in over there. But then I, then I also went to Fast Track. And Hillenberg came over and talked to me and took my resume and then he goes he goes could you just wait right here and if anybody knows andy hillenberg he's always got a dip in his mouth and he yeah. just kind of talks like this you know so he's yeah. like hey just i tell you what uh mr matt would you just uh, hang out here for just a second so he went across the shop and i'm thinking if this is my window right here i'm not moving and i was gonna and i had to work that night i yeah. didn't I had a night shift that night i'm just like screw it i'm gonna be late i don't care yeah. i'll wait here he made me stand there for almost 50 minutes before he came back around, I didn't even move. I didn't wander around. I didn't look at pictures. I stood there stoic with my feet in the same spot, and I just stared at him as he went from car to car out there in the shop. I didn't move. So he came back, and he goes, you know, you've been standing here for 50 minutes, and you haven't moved. I said, no, sir, I have not. I said, I want the job. And he goes, well, judging by your resume and where you went to school, you're, you're kind of overqualified for what I have for you. I said, I don't care. <laughs> And he goes, well, would you be willing to be a road mechanic on our on our cars here? And I said, yeah, I would. And he goes, okay. So uh, gave me a real interview, and I became a basically a traveling mechanic to keep the school cars running as these uh, students came in and, and paid for, like, you know, a three-day school, a five-day school, or if they just wanted, you know, a two-day school, right? <clears throat> and these were people with a heck of a lot more money than me because I couldn't afford a driving school. But working there... I got to learn the same thing they did. I got to drive the cars every single day, warm everything yep. up, and then yep. not only that, but but work on um, everything to do with the car, you know. And then, then also, whenever it was time to change tires, because the the students had worn out, worn them out, I always pretended that I was changing tires. There you go. With an electric impact. Right. Yeah. What year was that? You said ninety eight. Ninety eight. Okay. That was ninety eight. Right. Yeah. And so, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to work my guts out and. When that happened, Andy volunteered me for three different ARCA teams that year. One was Glenn Morgan. And if you don't know who Glenn Morgan was, he was an ARCA driver uh, from Texas. And he was one of the lawyers that won the cigarette lawsuit. Mm. Right? So this was his hobby was driving. Oh, okay. So I got to, um, I went to, I think, three or four races with him. Um, he f 
he paid everything, paid the way, paid for room and board, all that stuff, and then gave us a bonus after the races. And I was like, this is fantastic. This is yeah. like the most <laughs> money I've made ever, but it's only in a weekend. I need to do it every weekend, you know? Yeah. Um, my first time with my name on television was at Texas, and uh, the guy, the gas man only put one hose clamp on the gas. Uh, uh, what was the? Yeah. What's the, what, the, the dry brake. The dry brake. Thank yeah, you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One hose clamp on there. So when I came around from the right rear to the left rear, got dumped. It dumped 11 gallons of fuel yes. all over me. And right. if you in uh, tire change out there know that when you hit lug nuts, it makes sparks. sparks. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but that yeah. 76 Unical got in my eyes and in my mouth and in my nose and my ears. Everything. I was mm-hmm. completely soaked. So that's what happened to you. I see now. <laughs> it's one of a few things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the rum or yeah. all the beer. Never mind. Yeah. And that stuff slick too when you. Church wine I stole. When anyway. Saying, oh, yeah. So uh, Church. <laughs> so I jumped back over the wall. Somebody else changed the tires and then I had to go to infield care. But uh, that was the first time. And then I had to call my parents that night and say, hey, I'm okay. And my mom's like, what are you talking about? And I go, never mind. <laughs> all good you don't know never mind yeah that's a burns too mm-hmm. i mean bad like uh I, I didn't i wasn't around a lot because i was a jack man but sometimes it would splash over or whatever but you know it dries out your skin so fast yes it yes is, it is bad uh, <laughs> at the end of that year um i was thinking to myself that i was probably the hardest worker in the shop there yeah full of myself right yeah. But I wanted, so I wanted a little bit more money going into the next season of working at the driving school. And he says, he goes, well, listen here, um, I will, t- I'll tell you this, that, you know, you've been great here. You work really hard and I just, I really can't afford to pay anymore, but I do have something a little bit better. He goes, I got a buddy of mine who tests ARCA cars all the time. Uh, his name is Dave Marcus. And I'm like, I know who Dave Marcus is. Yeah. And he goes, and he's looking for a mechanic and a tire guy. And I go, okay. So he basically got me a job at Marcus Auto Racing. And, um, and so I had an interview over there and once again, I'm moving. So I moved from Concord over to Asheville and started working over there for Dave Marcus. Oh yeah. Wingtip shoe guy, oh, team yeah. real tree, number 71. Oh yeah. I know it well. Oldest yeah. driver in the series at that time. Um, an oldest hauler probably. Yeah. And yeah. we didn't even have a truck driver. <laughs> so <laughs> my right? job, my jobs actually were yeah. not only mechanic and tire guy and tire specialist, but every every Monday, I had to burn trash because he didn't own a dumpster. We burned everything. If it simmered, <laughs> sizzled, melted, smoked, whatever, we burned it all. Burned it all. All of it. No dumpster. Um, we also didn't have a truck driver, so I was the truck turnaround guy. Yeah. So I had to I had to restock the truck every single week. Yeah. Um, and wait for the actual truck driver to come in, who ended up sometimes being just a guy from a truck stop that Dave knew. Yeah. So he would come in and just shift gears. Well, you know? I remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, Marcus would get crew guys from the other side of the fence at the garage. Yeah. I took Mikey Modal's spot. If you know, if <laughs> yeah, you know Modal, no, Mike, yeah. Oh, yeah. Modal no, left and went to Sabco, and yeah. I took his spot. Okay. That's you right. Know? He always talked about Marcus. Yeah. Always talking about Marcus. Yeah. And That's he was because it is, so much, it is so much fodder yeah. for stories of crap you wouldn't believe. Sure. Oh, yeah. It just, yeah. it really is. Yeah. I mean, Dave would, Dave taught me. To cut zip ties so that you could reuse them. And to this day, mm. I still do that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. That's pathetic, but you can cut a zip tie on the bottom side and reuse yeah. it. Yes, yeah. it's shorter, but you yeah. can still use it. Right. He would after the teams would go out to pit road, he would have me go through the garage and steal everybody's shop rags. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, those sons of guns are like eight cents a piece. <laughs> I'm like, dear God, eight cents a piece. And then uh, if we were at a uh, speedway race, we always had a children's motor, I'm the, right? What do I'm you that way in my shop, by the way. So, Are you? Yeah. <laughs> Phil, Phil's laughing. I was thinking, gosh, I'm that way. And then I look at Phil and he's laughing. So yeah, he knows Your me. shop kind of looks like Marcus. There's crap everywhere, man. Uh, not anymore. It's getting better. Well, there's still it's crap everywhere. a lot everywhere. better. Though. There's still crap everywhere. You know those uh, 35-gallon barrels that, uh, that 80, 90 weight gear oil would come in? You yeah. know, the, not the 55-gallon, but the smaller ones? Yes. He's got five or six of those behind the shop that has every single spark plug he's ever run since the 1960s. Gosh. Why? Yeah. He kept every single one of them. You never know when you might need one. That's specific right. Specific for that engine. Just That's saying. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. You know better. I've got that disease myself. <laughs> it's hard for me to throw anything in a trash can. Anything. If you can get, yes. yeah, like two or three things a day, that's huge. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I dumped you oil do it, on my old shoes the other day. I went ahead and dumped some oil on them just because I didn't want to go back later that, that next night or the next day and pull them out of the trash can because they were done. Yeah. 
So anyway, that's they were, just, they were just done. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, it's just it's a non never ending. I don't believe. Um, so I <laughs> know <laughs> I didn't pull, pull them out. out Tuesday. I don't know. They might wash off. So <laughs> uh, Jim Dooley says, "Hey Ham, just between you and me, oops, too late for that. I also have a degree at CPCC. Actually, two degrees. I went for five years. Does that count for two years? Two degrees? I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. So uh, some, Sandy says, "Where's Kudzu?" And uh, <laughs> shocking. You know what? I told him Saturday night because we went to church. And you had just left there, whatever. And I told him we were going to be here tonight, but he didn't. It's his bedtime. It is. That's and and it is. anybody yeah. knows Kudzu, if you try and text him or call him like after 8 p.m., you get crickets. Yeah. He's, All right. <laughs> he shuts that thing off every night. Well, man. Now, you can't get a hold of him. And Sheila says, uh, we just need Kudzu here. And I, that's just kind of what I talked about us doing, getting together and doing some little video stuff like this right here, just have conversation. Doesn't have to be anything. This to, is called bench racing. Yes, bench do. racing, by the way. Right, you know, right, this right. is what we do when yeah. we're in the race shop. You yeah. know, we want to talk yeah. about old times. You just sit around with your other racer buddies and you just, you know, talk about stories that nobody would ever believe. That's right. But we, you know, we could talk, me and you and Kudzu could talk about anything. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, Ryan, do you know Ryan Binion? Yes. Hello, hey, Ryan. Ryan. He's, He's in Minnesota right now. So, Ryan, I hope you're warm. From the Lord, Lord Song and ben, Binion family. Yep. Absolutely. They live on Prior Lake, Minnesota. Okay. And, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Jana says hello from, from Daytona. Right on. And uh, let's see here. Somebody else said hello. That will be up to Phil. Uh, Carolyn Troutman. Hello to Matt again. Hello, yeah. Carolyn Troutman. Right, so. But uh, here's the other thing, too, about Dave Marcus's shop. And if you've never been into it, it's, in, um, it's not in a great neighborhood. It's in the ghetto. And there's a um, – we didn't have a body shop. We just had a room with a big exhaust fan on one end. <laughs> and so some of the neighbors would come in there in the middle of the day and go, Hey, y'all going to uh, paint a chassis tonight or paint something today? Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, matter of fact, we are. They close and, their windows. Uh, nope. They sat on the front porch. <laughs> they sat on the front porch oh. right in front of the exhaust fan and just went. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's free. I love it when y'all paint. Good time for free, right? <laughs> Can't make this up, man. I'm not, I'm not making this up at all. But yeah, this that is was in Asheville. Yes. Yeah, we, you know, uh, yeah, you chassis were painted with, I think it was called Enron or something like that. Not the banking thing, but it, yeah. it was a type of paint, <laughs> you banking, know, that yeah. was really, 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 um, it's like powder coating, basically. You know, it's really Emron. Weird. Emron, thank you. Emron, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's strong in the fume department. <laughs> oh, okay. So there would be four or five neighbors sitting out there on, on the front porch. Yeah. It's like, ah, what a great wow. day. <laughs> well, now, if you've ever known any NASCAR painters, they're all a little different. Yeah, and they all smoke. Yes, they all smoke. Every last they're one like of them. They're like photographers. Yeah, they are. They have their own. <laughs> uh, I'm just what's that, Tommy False? Oh man. Um, so we, um, I thought the coolest thing about being on a race team was working those late nights and ordering pizza about six o'clock and keep on digging because you're going to Daytona. Yeah, sure. You know that was back when we did testing. Yep. You had to alternate whoever was alternate in points. You would go on Tuesday, and the other ones would go on Thursday, or however it worked out. Um, and you also were still living in the Everham era. That's right. That's right. And that's when he, I think he changed the course of racing quite a bit as far as the crew guys. Well, that year in 99 was the year of the very first 15 second pit stop. Yeah. I don't know if anybody yeah. knows that, but I remember being, it was at Fontana, California and the, and the rainbow warriors busted off a 15 second pit stop. And everybody's like, what the crap just happened? You know? Right. And, and right. that was, a, that was a big deal back then. Sure. You know, I was used to watching the guys on the, uh, Rusty Wallace's number two car. Yeah. Watching those guys do fast pit stops. You know, and and it was just it was something to shoot for, something to strive for. You know, my right. my biggest hero, I think, before I ever got into changing tires, was Shane Parsnow. He was the front. Yeah, he was no the front. Shame. He was the yeah. front changer on the twenty four car. Yeah. And I remember after um, the whole Daytona race, I don't even remember where we finished. I know my first pit stop ever was on TV, though. I do know that, and I sucked, but it was on pits. It was on TV. My parents got to see it, and I kept the tire because I was the tire guy. And I gave it to my dad. So my first tire that I ever changed is in his garage somewhere. It's buried because there's a bunch of other crap in there, too. There you go. He knows where it's at. Though. Yeah, he, I'm sure he does. Yeah, along with that half-inch wrench I've been looking for. <laughs> but in Rockingham, I went and saw Shane and uh, introduced myself. And I was like, I go, hey, man, I just, I, I'm just i trying to model my tire changing style after you. And uh, so he's like, he's like, that's cool, man. Come on. So he took me to the DuPont hauler. And took me up into the lounge and reached in his locker and he gave me a brand new pair of Ingersoll 
ran knee pads because I had a mechanics pair and they hurt my knees. So he gave me these Ingersolls and it was the nice, they were like super soft. They were great. They gave me support. And, and so Shane was a great guy to lean on as far as, you know, learning how to change tires better. You know, yeah. the, most guys are on their knees and they're and on their toes. But if you ever saw Shane, his legs made a W, made a W on the ground flat yeah. and, and his butt sat on the f- ground. So he was lower and more yeah. level with the lug nuts. And I modeled myself after that. Right. And, yep. uh, and, and that's those, how I ended up doing it. Those mechanics knee pads were like uh, two straps. And then the, then the other hands would like come all the way around, wrap around and stuff. And they were, they were a lot better. Your mom says, uh, she's listening. Glad to hear you both, mom and dad. Matt, she sent me a text. Hey, Ma, Kathy. stay underneath that weighted blanket. <laughs> it's not warm. She likes that? Oh, the weighted yeah. Weighted blanket? I got her a weighted blanket a couple years ago because it gets so cold up in Iowa. I got one for Tracy, but she didn't like it. No? No. Nah. So I just use it to keep my feet warm. You probably keep it a lot warmer in your house than, than my dad keeps it in their house. Yes, yeah, I'd say so. Possibility. Yeah. I think he means that he crawls inside of a duvet, and that's the weighted blanket for Tracy. Is that one of them spritzer yeah. things behind a toilet? <laughs> that, oh, I know. I was trying to remember what a duvet is. Oh, that's a... It's a covering for a... a I learned a, what it was. What's a duvet, ladies? It's, it's one of them cover, spritzer things in the back of the toilet. I think they got them in France. Comforter. <laughs> Good day, huh? mates. I learned, <laughs> what, do you, what do you call that? I learned it from Jana, the oh, duvet. You're talking about a bidet. My wife. Yeah, bidet you're talking about. I'm talking yeah, about potato, a duvet. Potato, potato. What about by night? Oh, so, I don't know. All right, so. <laughs> what the hell are y'all talking about? So, uh, what's up, Nikki Grant? Hey, y'all, she says. Man. Oh, Nikki used to be the uh, manager out there at Hobos. Okay. Hey, Nikki. Remember yeah, Nikki? Yeah, Nikki. Yeah, Nikki, yes. I always see her when as you show, Nicole. When you showed everybody your dance moves out there. Oh, yeah. I was pretty good. In the bedazzled cowboy hat. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. We did have those. That was awesome. I don't remember. No, there was no pink. we. Well, you had a pink. You had a purple or a pink I did not. You did. Oh, mine was. Yeah, this one I put, picked hey, up. Hey, how about Trixie and Lulu from the Nashville Hooters saying hello? Hey, y'all. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> uh, Suzette McGuire is out there. Fontana, her home track. Mm-hmm. I loved working for Marcus. There was, um, well, I say that now because it's been so many years afterwards, but it was probably the hardest I've ever worked, but the, but I learned so much. Yeah, it was it, yeah. basically his, his team was the school of hard knocks for everybody oh, that sure. wanted to get into racing. Yep. And being that you're at kind of at the bottom of the totem pole for sponsorship dollars, you know, you just you just have to do his his thing was we do the most we can with we what is it? The, the most we can with the least or the, the yeah, for the, the least. longest. We, we've yeah. done so much with so little for so long that now we can do almost anything with nothing. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That was it. Well, huh. he, he was the last of those that really <laughs> squeezed the dime. I remember one of the things we had talked about earlier was he was known for just the biggest appetite. I oh, mean, big time. He, oh, he would go in and crush a buffet, just out eat everybody. Which which you had to do after you got done working the racetrack because sure. he only gave you fifteen dollars for per diem a day and never had any food on the truck. I really? had to keep like a whole bag of chips away cookies in my backpack yeah. just so mm-hmm. I could eat something during the day. Yeah. But yeah, he would eat like crazy everywhere we went. You know, yeah. it's, and he was not a big guy. No. He's no. not a big guy. And everybody knows him about the wingtip shoes, right? Well, one day yeah. he comes out to me while I'm burning trash and he goes, Matt, let's go in the van. I got some iron surround. I want you to come with me. I said, All right, Chief. We all, everybody calls him Chief. So I get in the shotgun of the Team Real Tree van and uh, we go and uh, we're going down uh, 25, Highway 25 in Nashville. And I said, Where are we going, Chief? And he goes, He goes, I got to get my shoes resold. And I said, the wingtips? And he goes, yep, I've got the same pair I bought back in 1962, and the same Chinaman has been uh, resoling them every single year for me, and he only charges me $3 a pair. <laughs> wow. Oh, like, yeah, that's crazy. You, you guys' could, money's worth You could buy some Whoa. Simpson shoes. You yes. could do this, do, you know, but yeah. he was yeah. so tight on everything that he did. Yeah. Um, I think one of my favorite racetracks now it was probably Dover, you know, one mile asphalt high bank that kind of thing but now, it's where you will have your worst yeah. days 500 miles at dover you can have your worst Concrete. day there 500 laps. especially with the garage area in turn four yeah and if you don't yeah. qualify worth a crap and there's only 42 pit stalls at the time you have to share oh, a pit gosh. with brett bodine yeah in turn four it's no so the garage was in turn one we, garage was in turn one and we pitted in the very last right. stall mm-hmm. well none of our toolbox drawers locked oh gosh yeah and it's rough getting down there yeah and so yeah. We're racing, and all of a sudden, Chad Little in the 97 car, one yeah. of your cars. Yeah, the John Deere. Dumps Marcus. 
Phil, you might remember this because there was a ton of reporters in the garage when this happened. Yeah. He dumps Dave. We spin out. We have to haul the toolbox, toolbox all the way down pit road over the humps of the driveways for the horse track, get to the garage area, find out that the, the trailing arms are bent, the rear, the, the truck arm is bent, or the panter bar is bent. So instead of pulling new parts off the crash cart, you know what Dave decides to do? Mm-hmm. He goes into the hauler and pulls out a logging chain and throws it over the rear end housing on the left rear side. Then he runs the other end around one of the girders of the garage and then gets in the car and fires it up. All of the media is underneath there. And um, he throws it into first gear and just tries to rebend everything straight <laughs> with the race car. And the whole garage shook. And everybody <laughs> yeah, at yeah. the same time crouched down and then cleared out of the garage. And I don't remember who was doing the reporting. It might have been um, Bill Weber. But he comes up and goes, Dave, what happened out there? And he goes, I'll tell you what, that son of a bitch and Chad Little just dumped us coming off a of turn four right there. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you what, he can't see what yeah. he's doing. And uh, – I wouldn't buy a John Deere tractor if, if uh, somebody gave it to me. And if you got one, I suggest you sell it. Oh, my gosh. Cut. So John Deere was never his sponsor. I always wondered why. No, but they were. But no, John Deere tractors, the tractor yes. part, was was born in my hometown. Oh, yeah, that's right. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, everybody yeah. back home works there. You know? And it's yeah. like, oh, great. Yeah, that's yeah. great. We just trashed a hometown You're a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, but that was that's... the kind of thing he did. I remember when we raced in Martinsville. And we stayed at a place called the Marguerite. It's a drive-up motel. And I'd been warned about it. So I took an, air, um, an extra blanket, an extra, a sleeping bag with me, that it's not a great place. And so when you go check in, you have a drawer that slides out. And there's the paper that you sign. And then the drawer goes back in. And then you get the key. Mm-hmm. And they said, we've got a bar downstairs, but, it's a, but you can bring your own liquor in a brown paper bag. And I'm like, really? And they really? said, to yeah. A bar, huh? we, go to my, we go to the room. And it opens up, and there's the, the smoke detectors hanging by one wire, and um, the, the bedding is paper thin. There's food trash in the receiver of the telephone because it, it had a, and not a cradle, but you know what I mean? It had a, <laughs> it yeah, sat in there. Yeah. Yeah. And then so then I go into the bathroom, and uh, I'm looking at this, and there's three holes on the back wall of the commode. And I'm like, what the heck? And then I shut the door, and there's three corresponding holes. Bullets. Yes. Wow. That's where we oh, stayed. And do you man. think Dave stayed in the room? No. 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 He had his camper no. there, and he went over and pulled it over by the vending machines yeah. and unplugged the vending machines and plugged, <laughs> in, plugged in his camper. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, so, yeah, Kia and Jana says a duvet. A duvet. That's that French. Good day, yeah, mates. Yeah, that's a Is a cover you put on your down comforter. Comforter, yes. So, and. I thought it was, a, uh, I thought it was one of those things you put underneath your drink. Yeah. That's oh, that's it. a doily. One of these. Oh, doily, okay. Yeah. That's a coaster. Oh, well, that, yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Pam Ford says, hey, dummy, how I ham and feel. <laughs> yeah. If, not, if y'all don't know who Pam Ford is, yes. Pam was uh, one of our oh, officials yeah. in the in the series. She's a sweetheart. That's yeah. right. I've actually had her on a couple of times. She's kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah. she is. What's yeah. up, Val LaCrosse? Tuning in tonight. So along with that, you must have some good Earnhardt and Marcus stories because those guys were pals in the garage. Dave and... Um, Dale Sr. were best friends. Oh, they yeah. went hunting oh, yeah. all the time. Oh, they hung yeah. out all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll tell you this, a um, couple good stories. One, I remember being in, in uh, we went to Talladega to test. And from Asheville, I think we made it from Asheville in like three and a half hours. Dave was driving. Mm-hmm. I've, I never get car sick, but I was in the back of the van, and he hauled so much tail down the mountainside, going down to Interstate 26 or whatever it was. Yeah. I was getting sick. He was flying in this van. We get down there, and like I said, we didn't have any food on the hauler, and but Dave made us work through lunch anyway. So we're working, 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 and I go into the hauler to get something, and it's over lunch break, and Dale Sr.'s in there, and he's in street clothes. He's in a pair of jeans and, um, and a Goodwrench shirt. And uh, he looks at me, and he goes, doesn't Dave got any food for you guys in here? And I said, no, sir. I said, what we got here is is – Nothing. I said, I got a bag of cookies. And he's like, good gracious. He reaches in his pocket and he pulls out this big stack of cash. And he's like, how many guys got working here? And I said, I said, there's six of us. And so he counts out six $20 bills 
and puts them on the counter. He says, here, go get you something. Go get you some lunch so you guys can eat or whatever. And I said, thank you so much. And in hindsight, I wish I would have kept that $20 bill. I was going to ask you, yeah, did you, how many did you keep? I, I mean, I was hungry, man. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And, I, and I probably could have kept it because it wasn't an hour later. You know, he was sponsored by uh, Burger King at the time. All of a sudden, there was seven bags of uh, whoppers and fries and all yeah. kinds of stuff in there. You know, that, he said, take that down to them boys there. Yep, yep. And, and when Dale gave me that money, he said, he goes, give one of these to each one of the guys you got working here. And then he started walking out of the holler, and I said, thank you, sir. And he turns around, and he grins, and he goes, don't you dare tell anybody. All right. Nope, that and was I was it. like, that was so cool. And yeah. I was a three fan before I ever even got right. into racing, you know. I was a cool customer. So. I was a huge three fan. Yeah. Debbie, um, Debbie Haley says hello. Hey, Matt, from Haley Holler. You're the bomb. Yep. They live on War Valley Road over in Tennessee. They they used to live out by you uh, in Elmwood. Oh, okay. They had a place right there before you Haley's. get to the creek. Okay. All right. And yeah. then they, they sold that place and bought 53 acres or 50 some acres over on the west side of the, the Tennessee mountains. Oh, wow. And nice. they are homesteading. Yeah. Off that's, the grid. That's awesome. They're my heroes. Yeah. Heck yeah. So hello, uh, Donnie and Debbie. They're my heroes now. Kelly Farmer. Hey, guys. Hello, Kelly. It's nice seeing you two together again. Oh. Together. We're not holding hands, though. Again. <laughs> uh, the other time that I thought was really cool with Dale Sr. was um, we were in the D – Dave came and got me, and he says, he goes, hey, we need to go talk some tire notes with some of the other tire guys and crew chiefs. And I said, okay. So he takes me, and we go down, and we go into the 31 hauler, which was Mike Skinner and um, Larry, uh, Larry Mack. Larry Mack was crew chief at the time. And we go in there, and so Mike Skinner's in there, Larry Mack, and then in walks Kevin Hamlin and Dale Sr. And, all, and their tire guys as well. And it was like Shane Church and I think in Skippy was the tire guys. And we were all in there. And I didn't even pay attention to what the hell we were talking about. Because I was just like, I, I was starstruck. But I was still cool enough that I didn't like, you know, say, you know, try to embarrass myself. But I was just like, this is awesome. Yeah. This is like the coolest mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. I mean, because I wanted to work for Larry Mack. I wanted to be, you know, he was like, when he was uh, Davey's crew chief and Ernie's crew chief, I just loved how methodical he was. You know, after yeah. even after a win. He didn't like, ex, you know, celebrate and all that. He started writing notes. And I was like, man, that guy yeah. is sharp. He is, yep. he's on it, you know. So I always wanted to work for Larry Mack. Yeah. And uh, so being in the in the hauler there, just, you know, talking tires and, and strategy and all that was just one of the coolest things. I just loved it. I got goosebumps when I was in there, you know. And uh, because Dave never had any money, we never bought sticker tires. I was always known as the used tire guy. That was my nickname in the garage was, hey, here comes the used tire guy. So all the other tire guys would would give me their three lap scuffs, seven lap scuffs. I'd even take ten lap scuffs. It didn't matter. Yeah. And the day would be like, "Where'd you get all these tires at?" I'm like, "I'm making connections with all these other guys." Yeah. And I said, "These are their setup tires, their stickers. These are their scuffs. Blah blah blah." And, and I always had more than enough tires than what we needed. It was it was great. We never we didn't make all the races. I think that year we. I think we made actually two thirds of the races, and it was probably the most he had had made in a long time. Um. But it was a, it was a really good year for us. Yeah. It really was. You know, I think that was the year. You remember when Dale Senior passed eighteen cars in three laps to win Talladega? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, that was ninety nine. That was when, that was when I was on Marcus's team, and we had given him. I mean, we had one of their motors, so he used us as drafting partner. Um, and then also, I think I gave him a set of uh, tires that I had left over. Or something I don't even remember. But watching the three car start eighteenth with three yeah. to go and use side drafting the whole way up and win the race. If you guys have not seen that clip, do it. It is, it's, it's, it gives you goosebumps just to watch right now. Yeah. What a phenomenal driver. I was with Tony Cable that night, that day on oh, the yeah. back stretch. Tony. Okay. Yep. About was, that? was he officiating at that time? Yes, he yeah, was. Yeah, Tony, Tony Cable. Yep. 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 Tony yep. and Todd, dad, dad son combo. He's yep. been on the show. Yep. To watch that, click on this link. Tony Cable. I'll it, put it on. It was just so cool to watch yeah. that. Yeah, it was. You know, it was amazing. You know, and to be no. around for that um, and just to watch t something like that. And we all remember how any time that Earnhardt did anything good at Talladega, them stands would just go crazy. Oh, that yeah. Was Earnhardt fever there in Talladega. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and it was 50% booze and 50% Jaren. Yeah. Charlotte. Same, same as with Jeff, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And, now, uh, and same with Kyle. You know, you had your bad boys in the, mm -hmm. of the garage area. But now you got Chase, who's the big hero there in Talladega now. He's considered the local guy kind of being. Yeah. Um, you hear, hear his name a lot. Yes. We yes. heard it the other night. We were working out in the shop when the race was on. Well, I know you three uh, will know, or you two guys will know this as well, but it's like 
I, I, I look at that kid right now and I go, good gracious, he was only like two or three years old sitting on pit wall with those yeah. giant earmuffs on, yeah. sitting on his mom's lap, you know. Right. And I'm going, now that kid has won a championship? Yeah, yeah. already. And, and sitting on Earnhardt's lap, which is one of the coolest pictures ever. Yep. You know, when he was a kid. That was another thing too. I loved. I loved. I always had a poster of Mm -hmm. um, Bill Elliott and Junior Johnson with the with the original Budweiser car on my wall at home in Mm -hmm. my bedroom. So Mm -hmm. to be able to be in the same garage as him and actually be present and hear how he talked. Yeah, that was that was awesome. And if you don't know much about Bill Elliott, he has the fastest qualifying speed ever. What was it? Oh yeah, yeah, 212 two twelve point something something something. something. Yeah, Yeah. unrestricted. That was the one in a thunder chicken. That was documented because I think the actual, yeah, mm-hmm. the, the one that was actually documented. I think Rusty Wallace actually went the, the fastest ever, but but yes, that was the who that built that who the, built that motor. Ernie that, Elliott. Was it? Our, yeah, it was a brother. Been the Elliott brothers. Remember the time they unlapped themselves like two or three laps at Talladega <laughs> and won the race. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine that what NASCAR thing. would do now if they had races that were won by three laps or something oh. like that? You oh know? yeah, they would flip. Like, yeah. They, well, they would, like yeah. The competition is so tight right now. So it, it is. is yeah. it, it's a lot different now. Um, after I got done working for Marcus, and so we used to steal ice, by the way, too. So sorry to all your other teams. If you were looking for that 20-pound bag of ice between qualifying, we stole it. Hey, totally hey, did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I decided since that was the bottom of the uh, you know, the sponsorship deal, and I'm just like, all right, I need to work my way up. I'm just going to go. I'm going to work as fast as I can, run everywhere I go, and then maybe somebody will pick me up at the end of the season. That was my goal. You know, I was like, yeah. I'm treating myself like a free agent. And so I did. And I, and I and I got ribbed a lot. I always heard people saying, you know, run, Forrest, run. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'd tell them that they were number one, but I didn't care because I was trying to make it happen. For sure. Yeah, you remember where you came from. You're yeah. like, you have no idea how happy I am to be where I'm at. And, and remember this. I didn't know anybody. I did not know anybody to get into this. I mean, I had to make all the connections that I that I made coming down here. I didn't know anybody coming from Iowa. I just I just showed up in Mooresville. I just right. showed up, and I did mm-hmm. not care what I got paid or if I got paid. I just wanted to race. Yep. You know, that's all that's all that mattered to me. I just wanted to race. I wanted yep. to make my folks proud. I wanted to make my brother proud. I wanted to make my best friends proud. There was like five uh, good pals of mine back home that believed I could do it, and I always told them that I would get them into races, and I did eventually. But, but it was like everybody else was just you know naysayers, right? You know, and it's like, so you worked at um, all right. So you worked for Marcus, and then you were obviously on a lower budget team because you know when you when you're on a lower budget team, of course you end up working a lot. It a seems ton. like you work a lot more hours and harder, and they don't have the money to buy to pay other employees, and you don't have the extra well, help. That and we drove everywhere, and you drive everywhere, right? And Versus we didn't fly. Jumping I mean, on, your we had a team real tree van with six nasty guys in there, yeah, and, and there was a it. bunch of times when I would get rudely interrupted by the driver falling asleep and running over construction cones. Whoa. Yeah. Just like that. And everybody at the same time, want me to drive? Want me to drive? Oh, I've been there, done that too. <laughs> you know, and, and then when we did fly, it had to be west of the Mississippi, and we wouldn't fly mm-hmm. out of Asheville or Charlotte. No, no, much cheaper to fly out of Atlanta. So let's drive four <laughs> hours to Atlanta, <laughs> right. park at the Holiday Inn, because then we wouldn't have to pay for parking, and then take the shuttle over to the airport to fly out of Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, That's that's Marcus Auto Racing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what we did. And at the end of that year... Um, the last race was in Atlanta. It wasn't Homestead yet. The last right. race was in Atlanta. Right. And I was gluing up lug nuts. And Michael Landis from Hendrick Motorsports came over and sat down with me. And he says, are you Matt? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, my name's Michael. I work at Hendrick. Um, and uh, Ricky, Ricky Hendrick is going to, they're going to start a Bush team for Ricky next year. And I was told to come see you and want to know if you'd be interested in a job. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I said, yep. And uh, he says, he goes, in a few weeks after the season's over with, he said, in the banquet's all done. He says, he goes, I'll give you, he goes, I'll, here, here's my number. Give me a call, and I'll tell you where the shop is, and uh, you can come see me. Did you look at him and kind of wake and said, Mr. H sent you, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you have to do any commercials? I know I've been talking a lot. No, 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 you're fine. Uh, Bob, uh, let's see, Bob Farmer says, we're tuned in. Hey. That's Callie's dad. Hello, Bob. That's what I was thinking. It must be one of those farmers. Farmers. Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh. I went over there and I toured the shop. It was over in Denver. It was Gary D. Hart's old shop over there, and um, it was it was right next to one of the Parker brothers. You remember when the, the one of the Hank Parker? Yeah, Jr. Hank Parker Jr. is right yeah. next to his shop over there behind the car wash. Yep. And there was only two people in there. There was Patrick Donnie, who was the crew chief. <laughs> I know Patrick. Yep. You know, uh, and uh, Michael Landis was the team manager, and Lance McGrew was the yep. shop guy. Yep. 
Oh, wow. Um, let's see here. Chris Happy Hamilton was the, uh, what did he work on? I forget. Oh, he was our fabricator. Um, and that back then, it was owned by Ray and Jeff. It was Gem Motorsports, Gordon Evernham Motorsports. Right. And right. it was the Pepsi car. Yep. It was the number 24 Pepsi car. And then Ricky was going to do just a, you know, they were going to do probably four or five races with Jeff. And then there was going to be probably 15 races with Ricky in the car. And so immediately as I took that job, I doubled my salary. I got to fly everywhere. Yeah. Nice. And it was a quasi branch of Hendrick. Right. You know what I mean? Kind of. Oh, well, with Ricky as your driver. Mm hmm. And, um, so I was like, all right, cool. Another yeah. foot in the door. Another sure. foot in the door. Mr. Hendrick did not want us to race in Daytona. He didn't want his, his first race for his son to be a super speedway. So we went to Rockingham, the very, very first race. And I think Ricky at the time was more worried about how he looked because he came walking down pit road, adjusting his collar, making sure his, his, his Sparco turtleneck was upright, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And we missed the race. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in qualifying. So we had to load up. And as we're loading up, uh, Ricky's standing next to me and he's, he's my brother's age and he's standing next to me and he goes, he's like, Maddie, what are you, um, what are you doing this weekend? Or he says, no, what are you doing tomorrow? Cause tomorrow is obviously going to be Sunday. And I said, you know what? I said, I still don't know Charlotte very well. So I figured I'd just ride around town and kind of get to know the area mm -hmm. or whatever. And this is back before, uh, GPS and Google maps and all that stuff. You had a folding paper map, everybody. So right. That's what I was going to do. And he says, he goes, well, that's, he goes, that sounds like a good idea. He says, but um, I'll tell you what, he says, me and my high school buddies are going to go out to the lake house and spend the day on the water. And he says, you're welcome to come if you want to. And I said, sweet. I grew up on the water, uh, grew up on a, on a river back home. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. You know? And so he gave me the directions, went over there and I was thinking I was going to pull into a mansion. Right. No, their lake house is like 1200 square feet. Yeah. It's three bedrooms, a kitchen, and a living room. That's it. So unassuming. And it just made me love the family even more. I'm like, they could probably buy the cove, the whole cove where the, the house was. But no, sure. they just they had the, they just had a lake house. Yeah. And then they had, you know, they had a pontoon and a ski nautique and a, and a scarab and then Ricky's boat and a couple jet skis, right? They had yeah. the toys, but yeah. they just didn't have. I was over at uh, Blaze's house, and, we, and Ricky was there. So uh, I rode with him to go trade out the big boat. Cause it was starting to get dark and mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't want to, uh, it did, I don't know. He couldn't, didn't want to run the lights or whatever. Didn't have lights on it. I'm not sure it was a speedboat. Mm -hmm. So we would drive back over to his house and then here comes his mom and dad out. And it's just like, he's going, getting home to trade out the car, you know, or to trade out the boat. <laughs> and so uh, come down there and Such swapped a good out. Kid. Yeah. Did they have a yacht there? No yacht. No, not so they didn't have one like our sponsors, Jersey Cape Yachts. Boats and toes, boats yeah. and toes. You want both of those in the water, by the way. Boats and toes. Yep. Toes. <laughs> That's right. That, that could be your new slogan <laughs> if they don't have one. Uh, yep. Jersey Cape Yachts. Yep. They're, you can uh, reach Jersey Cape Yachts at 609-965-8650. That's uh, the big guy on there, Wayne and Janine. They'll take care of you. I love being on the water. Yep, and you can uh, email Janine at Janine at Jersey Cape Yachts. How do you spell Janine? .com. It's with a G, G-E-N-I-N-E. -E. Yep. Kind of like Janine. G9? <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Wow, well, just say, the, just say the, the company name so that way you don't screw that email up again. <laughs> right, 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 yes. All right, so I had a croak. Uh, croak. <laughs> Sorry. Craig Smokestack. Frosty, what's up? That's my old car chief. Phil, you know who him. So, yep, sure do. You know Frosty, and and uh, Craig's wife Lisa is the tire chick that everybody yeah, has seen on she's TV. Sweetheart. She's still. I saw her recently, like a year ago. Yep. Or in 2019, it was. Yep. We were all they got back. a daughter named Rayla. So Ray, if you're listening, hey, how's it going? Yeah, so um, also, I think maybe my son Sam is watching as well, who is oh, now 14 up? and as tall as I am. Wow. So what's up, big boy? What does uh, Lisa say? Lisa or he says Lisa's younger twin brother getting it done. G E M. That's right. Where it all started for us. That's right. Uh, Craig started just a few months after I did. And uh, he was working as a mechanic. And then, then he got promoted to car chief on Ricky's car. We also ran five truck races that year as well um, in conjunction with Jack Sprague and the 24 truck team. Uh, Dennis. Uh, oh, shoot. What was Dennis's last name? Spencer? No, 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 no. Dennis, Dennis Connor. Dennis Connor, Connor was, the, yes. was the crew chief. Right. But uh, so Craig started a few months after I did. And then Lisa was the tire chick on Sprague's truck. So the very first truck race we went to to run, Ricky was in the 17 GMs, GMs, GMAC truck. 
and then Jack was in the 24, either Quaker State or GMAC truck. So we had two of them out there. And her and I sat down. I think it was Richmond is where we were. And she started talking. And, you know, she her, she carries out her O's. Like, oh, shoot. Yeah, you ever yeah. been out the boat? Right. Oh, yeah. You betcha. Hey. And I said, wow, you sound like you're kind of like from my neck of the woods. I said, where are you from? She goes, I'm from Shakopee, Minnesota. Minnesota. And I was like, oh, my gosh. This is great. <laughs> So uh, with Craig and Lisa on the deal, uh, we were like, yeah, we were all like brothers and sisters uh, on on one team, and we worked together for a very long time. It was it was fantastic. Um, Pam, it was a good group. Pam Ford wanted me to ask if uh, if you and was changing only five when they lucky dogged themselves like four times back to the lead lap at the Watkins Glen. I don't even remember. Yeah, I don't remember if we did that or not. I think that we were. Uh, yeah, so think about it. And if, about it. you know, and and there was a time before the lucky dog where you actually raced back to the checkers, yeah, or uh, to the yellow flag. Yeah, you know, yeah. as soon as the yellow came out, you tried to you tried to beat and try to get your laps back. back. I mean, and you could have like five or six cars. You could even, if if the leader like got off the gas, you could have ten cars all get their their laps back. Yeah. You know, and then start. Then people started to be like, "No, I'm not going to let you get your lap back." And then so then they started, doing, and then people were wrecking and crashing under caution. Yeah. And so they're like, all right, we're going to do the lucky dog now, one car at a time. I think we figured out we were at the uh, at Myrtle Beach probably the same time, 2000. Yeah, we raced there oh, one sorry. time, and uh, Ricky had NASCAR Speed Parks as a sponsor for that, and mm -hmm. they actually had one down there. So we raced at Myrtle Beach one time, uh, and we also raced one time at South Boston Speedway. Yeah, been there Virginia. too. Probably the same year when I went. But I was talking to Ricky before that race, and Jimmy Johnson was there as well. Jimmy was in the 92 Herzog car. Yes. Right, yep. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's also the year that Jimmy, if you've never seen the highlight reel from when he was in that 92 car, and his brakes failed on the front straightaway, and he dove into turn one wide open and Nerf slammed. Thing. Yeah. And he, he got out of the car and, um, and stood up on the roof and put his hands up, you know, oh. just like that. And, uh, and everybody's like, oh, my God, he's alive because yeah. he hits so hard. And then when he was, him and Ricky were really, really good friends. And so when they were in the hauler, I was like, dude, what did you do when you realized that you didn't have any bra front brakes? He says, he goes, honestly, he goes, I let go of the steering wheel. I put my knees kind of on the bottom of it so it can kind of hold it steady. And then he goes, um, I put my, I put my arms across my chest and put my chin down and putting his chin down, basically put his head in the position it would be in had he not done that and hit the wall. Yeah, so you know what I mean? It would have been that snap, snap you know? Yeah. So he basically braced his chin against his sternum so his head was already there. Because, I mean, how much does a helmet weigh? 10 pounds? Oh, yeah. Something like that. That's a lot of extra sure inertia is. along with your sure eight pound is. head. Everything else is stopped. And I only know it's eight pounds because I watch Jerry Maguire. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, Wayne Publis. But that's, that's really good. how Jimmy got over to Hendrick was because him and Ricky were such good friends. Yeah. What's the um, comments over there, Phil? Comments or ask Matt about the smudge pot. <laughs> Steve Crone from uh, yeah. Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. We were roommates uh, and uh, and teammates over at Red Bull. And congratulations to Steve and everybody over at Front Row for winning the the Daytona 500. Yes. How about that, Michael McDowell? Yeah. And awesome. Uh, so gosh, Steve sent me a uh, Smudge Pot sent me a couple pictures of the of the Harley J Earls Trophy and and the big fat ring and they had yep, some. Yep, I saw him. Steve's a friend of mine. Yep. That's pretty cool. Steve is the only guy I've ever seen eat four double Whopper cheeseburgers in one evening. And I said, look, man, I am, we're roommates. And I'm like, I am not giving you mouth to mouth. You're going to die. <laughs> You're going to die. <laughs> four double Whopper cheeseburgers. And Frosty, Craig, Craig Smokeshead can back me up on that because he was there too. But, oh, my God, just the gut no, rot. No, no. Let's mess it. Uh, so, Wayne, what's that uh, mean there, Phil? The what's G, that? He said the G9. Wayne I don't know. I'm sure that's a type of boat. One of their boats they have, or maybe an engine. Gene, Wayne can let us know. I Wayne, know. can we demo those boats? I don't know. If you want to get up there to yeah. Lower Bank, New Jersey, that's where they're located. What exit? They they build custom Third, boats. Um, they don't necessarily have a, a showroom full of boats. They'll take your old yacht and refurbish it and make anything you want brand new. But they build custom-made yachts. When you come to the level of owning a yacht, it's custom. You can you can you refurbish my dinghy? I don't know. You can oh, yeah. give I need my dinghy that. looked at and uh, could refurbished. Be. Could be. <laughs> Hold on, is that the one we were in the parade together? <laughs> that's the Cadillac. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, that's the Cadillac. Yes. I actually have a boat from Cadillac, yeah. Michigan, and and it's 
called it's called the Cadillac Boat Companies, and it's from 1960. Mm. We, mm. it was my grandfather's boat. Okay, but that's legit. They yeah. had nothing to do with cars. It was just a a boat company in Cadillac, Michigan. Look he it saw up. a picture of it. I showed you uh, when we were in the parade. Yeah, Bill. I skied yeah, behind that thing that. when I was about five wow. or six years old. How about that? It's crazy. Uh, so, uh, Sissy Odell wants to know. No, wait a minute. Hey, Sissy. That's right. Matt and him uh, do, uh, do go go together well, don't they? Hey, Phil and other cat. You other cats. cats. Oh, other yeah. cats. Okay. Yeah. Somebody had a question here. It just disappeared. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, it did disappear. Retracted. B. Oh, G nine is that's a good nickname for Janine. Oh, yeah, that's Wayne's wife. Oh, that makes sense now. Yeah, okay, G9. okay. Yeah, when you go to their house, is it called Wayne's World? I don't know. Wayne, you could go. That's Jersey Cape Yachts. <laughs> yeah. That is Wayne and Janine's World. Party yeah. on Wayne. Exit forty four. Party hard. Party on yep. Wayne. Twenty one forty three River Road in Lower Bank, New Jersey. Yeah. And there's another question there. Ask Matt about beating Kyle Bush on tractor race at Bonfire. <laughs> Lol. Yes, I had a um, I had a little get together out at my house down in uh, Kings Mountain area, and uh, Kyle came down. Uh, so it, we're jumping ahead, but Kyle, I, I worked for Kyle Bush um, when he was driving our cars at Hendrick, and so Kyle came down. We had our whole team down there, um, and so I put him on one of my uh, old John Deere tractors. I had a, third, a 1939 John Deere B, and I also had at the time a, a 46A. And both of them are two cylinders. Now, engine guru here, you're going to love this. The 46A, Yeah. it had 350 cubic inches in two cylinders. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a crazy. big piston and a big connecting rod. Yeah, sure enough. And so I put him on the slower tractor on purpose, and our truck driver, Bones, Talmadge yes. Patton, Bones, mm -hmm. yeah. he, uh, he and I were on one tractor, and we put Kyle on the slow one. And, yeah. and we come up over, we, we gave him a head start and then we put it in road gear and we caught up with him on the crest of a hill and I had to slam on the brakes with bones on the back of the, of the tractor yeah. so we wouldn't hit Kyle. Oh, yeah. And then I think it ran out of gas. Oh, imagine that. So, and we had to walk back on the gravel yes. road. I wonder what, I've seen some pictures of uh, Talmadge there, but he's with, he was with Sammy Kershaw. His yeah, bus he's driver. Sammy Kershaw's bus driver. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and also uh, Eric. Tipton. Aaron Tippin. Aaron, Aaron Tippin. Yeah, that's Eric's brother, Aaron Tippin. <laughs> that's old man Tipton's boy. Yeah. Mm. So Wayne <laughs> says he can refit your dinghy. No Sweet. problem. And take you for a ride anytime at all. Yes. You know, they're up in, they actually live up in Cape Haven. And um Janine actually lives in Wayne's world. G nine. <laughs> G9. G9. Oh, that's right, G nine. I'm gonna put that in my phone now whenever <laughs> I text her. It's gonna be G nine. So uh Paul yeah. Rodriguez says, I like anyone that beats Kyle Bush. Yeah, so fast forwarding, not fast forwarding, but your next career move from there. Well, the Hendrick story is 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 a, is a little bit longer. It's I mean because I was oh, yeah. there for seven and a half years. Yeah, stick with that. And you know, I I, I, I worked for Ricky, that. and um, we went truck racing, and we finished. I think we finished third in the truck points uh, the following year in two thousand and one with Ricky driving. I think uh, Ted Musgrave beat us in second, but Jack won the championship. So I actually, because Dennis Connors was so, he was such a stickler about one team, two trucks. We had mo we had morning meetings every day, and it was like he goes and and as much as we actually acted like we were two different teams, he would put a chair in the middle of the of the break room, and when we walked in and saw the chair sitting there, we're all like, oh crap, it's a chair meeting, mm -hmm. we're in trouble. So grab a donut, get something to drink, and sit there because you're about to get your your butt handed to you. And he sat there and he swiveled on this chair with his arms crossed and he goes, I don't know how many times I got to tell y'all we are one team that races two trucks and you better get that through your thick skulls or I'm going to mix and match everybody up mm. on everything. So we were, from that point on, we were one team that raced two different trucks. And because of that, we as a collective whole won the championship in 2001 and I got a, I got a truck ring for doing that. Um, yeah. And that was with the net zero truck back in the day. Right. And no, not everybody knows this, but Jack Sprague did not like fast racetracks. He was a short track racer. He absolutely hated going really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Didn't like it. Well, we go to Darlington for the truck race the very first time. Remember that? Yeah. We had Donnie Allison teaching Ricky how to dive in into the corners or, you know, or not lift. Yeah. And um, so when we go to qualify, Ricky gets the pole. And the very next truck right behind us is Jack. And he's like, he had so much pride and angst. He was like, I am not going to let that kid beat me. But it's Darlington. 
right? So he goes out there and he beats us by like three one hundredths of a second or something ridiculous like that. And he gets out of the truck and he is white as a ghost. And I'm like, dude, are you all right? And he's like, he goes, well, I dove it into turn three, saw God, waved, and then kept on digging. <laughs> and he goes, and I'm here. That's pretty much how it went, you know? And so he got the pole. We started second. So the front row was with, was both of our Hendrick trucks at Darlington. So that was really cool. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we won the championship that year. And so we decided to go bush racing the very next year in 2002. Jack was going to be in a, in a bush car. Ricky was in the bush car. And season started out normal. We ended up going testing out in Vegas, and that's when Ricky got into a big wreck, huge wreck in turn four, and destroyed, destroyed his right side shoulder. Mm-hmm. Like it just looked like a shark got in there and just ripped it to pieces. Um, I've got a lot of uh, old pictures uh, in storage of what the car looked like and and the amount of impact that it actually took, you know, with with the frame and everything. And it was like when you look at it, you're just like. How in the heck did that happen? But strange things happen in transport in a truck and strange things happen on any crash. And it's really amazing when you can just look at a wrecked car and watch what took the impact, you know, because right. because yeah. any car, it just it, yeah. it just explodes and everything right. goes flying everywhere. But energy. a stock car, it has crumple zones, you know, on purpose and it absorbs all that stuff. So it, it was it's crazy. Well, anyway, that ended Ricky's career, his yeah. driving career. He was never the same after that. Um, when he got his shoulder rebuilt, his best friend, Joel Suggs, you know, Joel and Brandon Suggs, uh, he, Joel and I stayed up with Ricky, uh, at night and gave him his meds every like two or three hours just because he was in so much pain. Um, so that, that ended his driving career and he became just the car owner at that point. First car, first driver we got in there was Ron Hornaday. Holy crap. That guy is something else. Yeah. Wide Um, open. Yes, wide open, mm-hmm. and you talk about gaining positions on any restart. He used to just tell us, hey, guys, watch this, and we'd be sixth, you know, on a restart, and all of a sudden, by the time he exits turn two, we're second yeah. or leading. It was just nuts what Hornaday could do. He yeah. drove for us in our, when I was the jack man in 2001, the Channel Lock car. Mm-hmm. He was the driver, and, yeah, when he got in the car, it was like, wow, what a difference. Um, you, you like Earnhardt stories, right? Ron mm-hmm. told us a story that when he was out in California living, uh, I think he's from, uh, is he from Marin, Marin, California, Marin, uh, Marin County, something like that. So he said that when he was going to drive Earnhardt's truck, what it was the Napa truck, right? Yeah. Yeah. That Earnhardt flew him out to Concord. He landed there. Earnhardt picked him up in a suburban or something like that, Tahoe. And on their way back to the truck shop over there on highway three, right by DEI, they got behind this guy in a pickup truck, and he was like, I guess he was doing the speed limit, but Earnhardt didn't want to do the speed limit. So he gets right up on this truck's bumper, and he's right on it. Like, And Horner's day is like, he goes, dude, I'm telling you, he was drafting. He goes, he was probably two inches off the bumper. And then he backed off a little bit, and then he would get up, and, and, you know, and he was like flashing his lights, honking, and Trust. this guy would not get out of the way. Yeah. And there was a couple spots he said that Earnhardt could have passed him, but he didn't. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, he just guns it and slams right into the, the back end of this pickup truck. And Hornaday is grabbing the oh crap handles in the car. It was like, this guy is a madman. What is he doing? <laughs> sure. And he's like, and, and then he hit him a second time. And then he goes and passes, you know, and honks at him and flips him off or whatever. And Hornaday was just like, Dude, what are you doing? And Earnhardt looks over at him, smiles, and said, "It's okay. He's sleeping with my daughter." Oh my gosh! <laughs> so who is it? Uh, I don't even know who yeah, it was. Yeah, I can let's see, see that. I have I no idea. That. But can you imagine? Yeah. Gosh. Just riding G- along, and yeah. Earnhardt just slams into some random car going down the highway. I was wondering if it was uh, was it Jimmy Illich or what? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? I don't know, but it might be a good a good story to ask Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we had Hornaday in there for a while, and then. Um, Ricky wanted to change things up, so we got David Green. And we got David Green in the car. And all of a sudden, things just changed big time. And we were getting top fives, top fives, top tens, top fives, top tens, you know, in the latter half of the season. I mean, and we gained so many points positions. And if and a few folks don't know out there, when wherever you are in points, that's how you park your hauler. And so every week, our hauler is moving positions in the garage, you know, and we're getting closer to the front. Yeah. And, and it was like... Holy crap! This is great, and I don't even, I, th- I don't remember. I think we finished in the top five for points, or maybe even the top ten for sure in in points that year with David. Um, owner points anyway, not driver points. But when that happened, all of us in the in the team was like, "We're gonna have David Green next year, and we're yeah. gonna we're gonna make a run for it. This is fantastic, right. you know." And uh, we were super excited about that. 
And then in the off season, we have a team meeting and Ricky comes uh, and he talks to us and he goes, all right, guys, he goes, I want to talk about next year. He said, uh, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about this. I know David's done a great job and uh, oh, I appreciate everything that he's done. And it's like, and we're going, oh, whoa, whoa, don't, don't change things. And he goes, he goes, I've decided to put Brian Vickers in the car. And you could like mm. kind of hear everybody kind of exhale a little bit. And all I said was, the redheaded kid in the 40 car? <laughs> like in total disbelief. <laughs> like, what are you thinking? Are you out of your mind? Yeah, we're buddy buddies. <laughs> like, we're doing good here. What are you going to do? Put, why are you yeah. going to put that kid in there? You know, his, his dad yeah. owns CV products, you know? And I'm just like, right. is it because of that? What's the deal? Mm-hmm. So we go to, so all right, so we're out. We just, you know, it's not our choice. So we're like, all right, we got BV in the car. We go to Daytona to race. We wreck and we finish dead last. All right, sets up our year. We're dead last in points, yeah. finished dead last in the race. Now we're going to Rockingham. And, uh, but we didn't, he had this, he had this picture on the toolbox of a pelican strangulating never a frog yeah. in his mouth. And he said, and it said, never give up. Yeah. They put okay. that on the toolbox. And it's like, okay, if that's your attitude, we just, we just finished dead last at, at the biggest race for our series. But all right, we're not going to give up. So we kept hammering on it. We kept doing, you know, we kept improving our pit stops. We kept changing, you know, keeping up with our strategy and having a good time at the same time. Yeah. And then pretty soon we're in the top five. We just kept getting top fives. Like when we sat there at the banquet after winning that championship, it was like when they listed off how many top tens and top fives we had, it was like, holy crap, we did. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But the first race, um, we're at IRP. Which, it, this was at the little track, the the little raceway park, which was so much fun to oh, race I there because you didn't if you didn't have a ticket to sit in the stands, you sat in the grass in turn one or yep. going into turn yep. one. Yep. Um, one of my favorite places to race. You had to park outside. You did have to park outside, tracks. which was a real pain in the butt. You had to pull all your toolboxes yeah. in, everything, you know, down the back straight away across mm-hmm. the track and do that. And so it was, a, it was a lot of extra work as far as a crew member standpoint. You didn't have carts. It was all manpower. And uh, I remember, getting, you know, changing into my fire suit in my skivvies out, you know, in the middle of the field Talking there. Lot, yeah. That's all. That's all you can do. Yeah. But on one second, see uh, Ray Durham's tuning in. He's he's getting ready to check out. So we'll see you later, bud. Ray. Yeah. He's a uh, say. He says Carolina Pyro. It's South Carolina Pyro. Guy. Ooh, let's burn something. Yeah, I know. Right. That's what I think of whenever I see that. I think about you because I know you like to burn stuff. Non-flammable challenge so, uh, accepted. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all right. So anyway, you're at. Uh, so we're at IRP okay. and. Uh, Steve Meal boys, Shane Meal is a driver, and he is notorious for wrecking people. Hmm. Notorious, Dri- like driving way beyond what the car oh, might do, yeah. and you oh, know, yeah. and and wrecking, and just yeah. and not yeah. being very nice, very bold. And I don't want to. I'm not going to speak badly of Shane right now because I mean he got into a wreck and got seriously hurt. So, um, yeah, right. He, but he's he's doing good now. So yep. I don't want to go off on him. Yep. But here we are. We raced him side by side for almost 20 laps at the very end of the race. Like there's 20 to go, and we're side by side with Shane. And we're, and we're just racing. And it's like all of us are just biding our time. We're just like, all right, when's he going to dump us? When are we going to get wrecked? And it was so close every single lap. And then with like two to go, we get past him. And it was like, oh, my gosh. My mom and dad are there. My brother's there. My brother's actually working for the company. Um, he came in on 2002 as an IT guy. So my brother was there. My parents were in the grandstands. My uh, aunt and uncle were in the grandstands. And here we go. And we win the race. And it's our first race oh, with yeah. with Vickers, you know, yeah. and we're going crazy and nuts. There's not a victory lane except on the front straightaway there, and because you know they always kiss the bricks over at uh, the big track, right. we decided that we're gonna we're gonna kiss the front the start finish line yeah, at wow. IRP. Yeah. So there's a picture of all of us with our hats backwards, and we're kissing the start finish line over at IRP. Yeah. That's cool. And we have to do the hat dance, right? At the end of the race where you win and you have to try on all or you have to put on all your sponsorship hats and all that yeah, stuff. Pictures, yeah. Well, my dad's in the half in the bag. No, he's he's 100 percent in the bag. Yeah. <laughs> and my brother went and let them in uh, and they're standing behind all you guys taking pictures. Well, yeah. You didn't even know this, but the, my parents are standing back there and my dad's going, Woo! Yeah, way to go, five five guys. Yeah, <laughs> you rock. And we're all laughing. If you look at our victory lane pictures, we're all hysterically laughing. Mm-hmm. Because my dad is behind all you guys uh, taking pictures. That guy. Just, okay. Just, I know who you're yeah, talking about. Going crazy. <laughs> and uh, it was so funny, but you can look at those pictures and, yeah, and still see that. Sure. And, and then, so that's where my dad got the nickname Liquid Larry. Speaking of that guy, I haven't seen, is Dickie Dennis 
Dickie's here. He's Dickie here. Dennis okay. is in the house. Remember yes. the uh, fence climber in 2014, Richmond? You know that. We talked about him before. He's watched us on the show. Pretty sure you mention it every week. I know, right? Well, pretty much. <laughs> I do, yes. <laughs> Dickie, are you still there? Dickie, give us give us a sign. So, uh, and I also want to ask uh, American, Post, American Legion Post 65. I'm not sure if this is uh, which person this is from there. Yeah. It's Kenneth Wallace or if it's uh, or Mike Or it might Morris. be Mike Morris yeah. or uh, his wife Amy Morris running that website. Oh, but yeah. hey, everybody from Post 65. Yeah, he says, love having the, the dynamic duo back on the air together again. It is kind of fun. Cool show, guys. Yeah. It's Always a good time. We um we won that race, didn't win the next one, but then we run the, won the next two in a row. We won Dover and we won Darlington. And that was the race where uh, Kyle at Darlington finished second. And so we had both cars. We had the 87 car because he was in Nemechek's car, okay, right? Yeah. But he was coming oh, yeah. to Hendrick the following year. So you've got the five car out there doing donuts and Kyle in the 87 car doing donuts as well, doing twin mm-hmm. donuts on Dar- in Darlington's front straightaway. Yeah. And that race, that particular race, the pit crew won the race for BV because we we came in behind or just in front of – no, we came in right behind Michael Waltrip. And he had his cup crew with him, and we beat them off pit road and ended up winning the race that way. Mm-hmm. And that was, gosh, that felt so good. Felt so good to do that. Um, and because we did that, uh, then we were leading the points. And whatever team was leading the points in the race following never was leading the race, was leading the points after that. So here we go into Homestead leading the points. And it's not by much. And in fact, if you remember correctly, the top five teams could all mathematically have won the championship going into Homestead. It was so tight. It was the two car, the 21 car, the 10 car, the 57. Uh, oh, no, it, it was not, not the two car. It was the 21 and also the um, 25 car with Bobby Hamilton Jr. Okay. So it was five cars that could have won the championship. And all those other teams, not us, all the other, like all the other teams, they put in second cars in the field. You know, yeah. stack in the field just to mess up the points type of thing. Yeah. Um, did I say the 37? The 37 was there. Well, anyway, I was sort of known for doing jokes and kind of being the garage funny guy. So the night before the race, I, I went to KB Toy Store and I bought a bunch of um, lifelike insects and I stuck them in the toolboxes of all the other teams. And then I wrote on the bottom, hey, it's been a great year racing all you guys. Whatever happens tomorrow, so be it. You guys were fantastic to race against. You know, that was when Budman was driving the 10 hauler and you had Big Guy on the 57. Yeah. Um, big Guy had a size 17 shoe, by the way. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. But it was, yes. it was, a, it was, uh, uh, Alan Mincy was on the 25 car at the time. Yeah. You know, a bunch of great racers, just diehard racers, guys that weren't there to tell their neighbors that they raced. These were guys that, that got dirty, got cut, got sweaty, you know, yeah. just, it didn't matter. You know, it was yep. all for the Did all for everything. the ring. Yep. Checkers or wreckers, man, it didn't matter. And that mm-hmm. was just the, the crew that we were racing against. And it was so much fun. And we had such a good time. But we went down there, they had, um, down to Homestead. And I can't remember if it was the new form, uh, format of the racetrack. So they gave us an extra testing day that year. Probably. Our first run out there, we leave the fill plug out of the rear end housing. What'd you do that for? <laughs> I got you. It wasn't me. It happens. I got yeah. But it happened, right? Yeah, right, right, right. And sure. um, and I, I don't remember if it made us wreck or not. I know we did. We I know we did wreck, and we had to fix the car. But that I don't think that was the catalyst for it. Um, but when we um, we came, the car came back in. We got hauled to the hauler during practice. Okay. And we got sat down and told, guys, dot your eyes, cross your t's. Don't do anything different. Do what you've been doing all year long, and we'll win this thing. Mm-hmm. But don't get jitters. And this was Lance talking. Don't get any jitters. Just go out there and do your thing. You know what you're doing. Have fun doing it like you do, but be methodical about everything. Okay. And we did, and we didn't have any mistakes after that. We did get a little bit of damage during, uh, during the race, but we ended up winning the championship by 14 points. And at the time, it was the closest ever. Mm. How about that? Uh, American Legion Post 65, the Morrises. Morrises. <laughs> yep. And uh, Tanya Wood tuned in. She says, hiya, handsomes, with the S. That's right. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, those were good days, Pam says. Absolutely, it mm-hmm. was. Um, so, one championship in 03, Best. and then in 04, uh, we had Kyle in the car. And then we've got, and just with Kyle in there, it was like, we got so many poles and wins, and we thought we were going to win the thing. Um, 
but we were going against Martin Truex, you know, and those guys on the one car, and and that was pretty tough. But they were great dudes to race against. And what year was this now? Oh four. Okay. Oh four. Yep. That's, um, yeah. But I remember being at Daytona with Kyle the very first time, and he kind of just stood there you know, all stoic and like, I'm the man type of thing. And everybody was taking pictures of him. You know, we had just won the championship with the five car. Now he's driving. And I just kind of looked over him. I'm like, I go, why don't you smile for the cameras a little bit? And he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, why? He goes, this is how I want to be. And I go, well, do you want to be Kurt's brother or do you want to be Kyle Busch? And he goes, I want to be Kyle. And I go, then do something different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then he started loosening up a little bit. You know, in 04, we, um, we lost a plane at Hendrick. And um, I could have been a, a backup tire changer for Jimmy that year. And I, um, he was, you know, of course it was at Martinsville. And I remember I was about mowing the grass and my ex-wife at the time came running out and she said, hey, you need to come inside. And I said, I'm almost done mowing. She's like, no, there's a Hendrick plane missing. And I said, what? And she says, yeah, you need to come in. So I went in there and I saw the, the ticker tape across the bottom of the screen. Immediately I called Lisa and uh, I said, what in the hell is going on? And she goes, are you ready? And I said, no, for what? And she says, they're all gone, mm. all 10 of them. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God. And that just really, it changes your priorities in so many different ways and what you're focused on possibly. And, you know, they always tell you, well, they would want us to race on. And I'm thinking to myself, do they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do they? <laughs> you know? We had just raced at Memphis and we and the day before, and we could have won the race, but we didn't take a set of tires. And Lisa and Craig are nodding right now going, yep, had a spare set of tires. We could have won the race. Yeah. But, and I said, well, things could always be worse. And little did I know the very next day, it, was, yeah. it, it got a hell of a lot worse. You know, we had flown on that plane so many times. Um, and that just sucked, you know. I, uh, my antics carried over into the into the company at you know at, at the at the headquarters, and I was the MC at all the bir the quarterly birthday luncheons and the Christmas parties and and the, and the things we did and and it just it made me smile a lot less you know and I knew everybody there you know John John Hendrick led a Bible study every Wednesday at Hendrick and I was there yeah. you know and um, it was gosh it was that was really really difficult and my 28 year old brain really wasn't ready for that massive amount of loss yeah. and I probably should have talked to somebody but I didn't because I thought I was cool and and stronger than that um so uh on that Thursday we ended up going to six funerals in a day mm -hmm. and it started at nine o'clock in the morning with Randy Dorton and then we went to the twins and John's and Ricky's funeral in downtown or in you know South Charlotte right. Um, I, th I think it was at Calvary. I don't remember where it was. Uh, but yeah, I, I think so. It was. But I down. sat in the balcony next to my ex-wife right. at the time, and she was mm -hmm. pregnant with Elijah, my first son. Yeah. And she started having contractions in the front row of the balcony during – Oh, my. Or That's just before trail. the service started. And yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh. That's where but, I got uh, married the first time. You did? Down there, yeah. How many times were you married? Uh, a couple. <laughs> <laughs> that you know of? In a church. Wait a minute. Never mind. Once. Once. <laughs> um, in a church. <laughs> That you know of. That. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah. So and then after after those four funerals, then we went to Joe Jackson's funeral. I think that was down in Matthew somewhere. And then we had to, then we had but we had to go racing. So we we went to uh, Signature Air in in Charlotte at the Charlotte Airport. And the Lowe's Corporation had given us their hawker to fly the corporate jet. It was uh, Mr. Tillman's Mr. Tillman's plane to fly down to Atlanta. I think it took like 35 minutes to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was the craziest thing. Um, so we flew down there and when we got to the racetrack the following day, we walked in as a group, a core group with everybody in the garage watching us walk in. And when we got there, things really, really kind of hit because there was a giant flower arrangement at the end of the hauler. And I don't know who was brave enough to put a decal on the car, but it was our job to unload the car. All the other teams had unloaded all of our stuff for us. They unloaded our toolboxes, our pick carts. They set up our scales in the garage area. Everybody in that garage came together and did something for us. Yeah. So we didn't have to do anything. It was the easiest tech day ever, you know, once we got the, once we got the car unloaded. But we right. unloaded the car. It had all 10 people on the hood. Um, I would love to say that after – that weekend that we were able to win the race, but we finished second to Matt Kenseth, you know, and, and I was glad that he didn't like let us win. So it was storybook, but 
I wish we could have just because of the circumstances. Sure. But yeah. Kyle drove as hard as he could, but the 17 was just quicker that day. Um, so really my mind, just uh, certain things changed in my brain. I stuck it out at Hendrick for a few more years, but it was really, really hard to walk into the to the shop and see that giant mural of Ricky and the rest of them right. at the entrance of the shop. And I was like, ah, man, I really want to get out of here. So Vickers went to Red Bull. Craig Smoke said went to Red Bull. And in the off season, Craig invited me to go to Red Bull with him. And I did. And uh, so there we are basically building a team from the ground up at Red Bull. And a lot of most people know what's what's the sponsorship for a team these days for a year. Uh, any any guess? Just take a guess. Forty million. I don't know. It, yeah. And you know what's funny about that? I remember whenever Junior got that ten million dollar sponsor for Budweiser. Yes. And it was like wow, that's just unheard of. That's yeah. so much. But yeah. You yeah. know what Red Bull spent in the very first year of their existence? No. Fifty five million bucks. Good lord. We invent, we invented we invented re reinvented the wheel. I don't know how many times. There were so many jigs and stuff that they would use on an open wheel car that they had up on the wall, and it was more like decoration because it never applied to a stock car hmm. and we try to tell so many of the engineers like hey this is stock car racing we rate we work on stock cars right <laughs> Just kind of trust what we're saying you know yeah. so that was a rough learning year there and i was there for two years and then the recession happened and me and about a dozen other people got let go uh, and so i was without a job for quite a few months i joined a randy moss's truck team uh, working for taylor malsam and doing the same exact duties as I was doing before. And then Slugger Labby called me and wanted to know if I, well, I, I left that team. And then uh, he called me and asked me if I wanted to drive a motor coach up to Watkins Glen for a driver that he was crew chiefing for. And I said, if it gets me in the garage, absolutely. So I was in Iowa when he called me. I drove home back here. I told him I had to do some laundry, met him at the shop, and then he goes, the, here's the only trick. He goes, the motor home is in Atlanta. And I go, let me get this straight. I just drove from Iowa, 16 hours, and I got to drive to Atlanta four hours to get a motor coach. Then drive back four hours and then go, go to Watkins Glen. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, and I need you there by 7 p.m. the next night. And I went, okay. Wow. So I grabbed me some Mountain Dews and some No-Dos. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and did that. And then once I was up there, I was able to, you know, of course, go into the garage area. And I went straight to Jason Ratcliffe on the 18 car in the Bush garage. And I told him that I didn't have a job and he couldn't believe it. And so he talked to Kyle and they went back to Gibbs the next uh, Monday and told Dave Rogers that they had a guy for for him, for his team to fill a, uh, a spot. And so uh, Dave Rogers called me in and I went to. Uh, went to the shop. It was like six o'clock at night, and I said, "Do you need to be? Does you, do you need to be home with your family?" I said, "It's late." And he goes, "No, no, no." He goes, "It's okay." He goes, "I work late all the time." I had a four-hour interview. I was there till ten o'clock when wow. we walked out of the shop, and he goes, "Can you be here for tomorrow for pit practice?" And I said, "Yes, sir." What time? He said, seven thirty. I said, "I'll be there." So I was at pit practice seven thirty, yep. and I changed tires with the twenty guys on the, the Home Depot car, and uh, he goes, "You got the job." So I worked at Gibbs for the rest of my career. We won the owner's championship, I think, four times uh, in a row with the 18, the 20. And I was hanging suspension for the 11, the 18, and the 20 to finish out that career. How about that? Steve says, uh, laser etching wallets at Red Bull. Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> Red Bull had this laser etcher. And instead of, you know, you take a, um, an electric grinder and say what team you, the tool goes to, the electric pencil thing. Yes. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Red Bull wanted everything laser etched. Oh, okay. So they trained me how to laser run the the Trotec yeah. mm -hmm. laser etcher, and I had to laser etch every single tool we owned for two teams, the 83 and the 84. Wow. And I'm talking eighth-inch T-handles, you know, yeah. wrenches, Whoa. hammers, everything. Well, then once we figured out how to do this and was kind of having fun, everybody was bringing in their wallets. They're like, hey, can you can you um, can you etch uh, <laughs> sure. beer money into this yeah. one? Yeah. yeah, I can. So we had uh, we had a guy up at. Uh, well, I won't say where, but we he had to laser itch uh, ro rocker rollers, rocker arm rollers. Oh, really? And and but, you know, because we, we started serializing every number on everything and he laser etched it on the part that runs against the valve tip. What did that do? Did well, they mess it up it's, at all? It's not good. I mean, that has to be a very good slick surface. So every one of those rocker rollers that they had made, 
very you know hard material whatever laser etched in the wrong place <laughs> it's cool that. looking but it's so time consuming yeah but yeah uh dave ellis remember him from jd and the breeze he's tuned in oh good deal he just uh got done sending me some uh, messages about some things that he was wanting to offload some good old souvenirs and i'm like yeah and i said are you watching now and he said i'll, I'll tune in but he says i'm here motor man i think yeah the three of us were in racing then in, in, in the best of times i mean i i really wish i could have started probably sooner you know yeah in the days of you know rolled up cigarettes in your sleeves and that kind of thing but oh, yeah. i would say this I, my first year or my first two years changing tires i was not in a fire suit i was in a pair of black pants and a simpson shirt yeah right that's it you know and i've got pictures of me t changing tires with a ball cap on and sunglasses oh, yeah. yep. and just gloves and knee pads and that was it you know mm -hmm. and, and a fast stop back then was you know 17 seconds right. 16 seconds yep. well i swear we were doing some 15s in the bush series so no uh, you weren't with the 87 car no you were checks. not that's how we win some races i mean oh, come out come on yeah <laughs> so, i don't know just about that, cup that crew thing but what i, I yes. think i think people have asked me what i want to get back into it now and it's such a different animal and i'm it is. i would miss what it was back then you know you could joke around you could have a lot of fun i mean i got and i I before 9-11 I used to make so many noises on on the commercial flights that we took that the stewards would come back and try to figure out who was making the chicken noise who was making who was making mm -hmm. um the the um the bit the dinger go off you know there was one time we landed on a commercial flight and we stopped on the jetway or on the taxiway and we hadn't got to the ramp yet and as soon as I felt the wheels lock I went and everybody in the plane stood up and undid their bu buckles and was getting their stuff out of there. And the stewardess got on the thing and she freaked out and she was like, everybody sit in their seats. But yeah. we had so much fun doing that stuff and it was so much like a family. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't know yeah. that it's like that now. You know, there's a lot of undercutting. Sterile. Yeah. It is. You know, it, it's very, and it's a very sterile environment. It went from the guys that worked on the cars on the weekend, worked on the cars during the week and then went to the track on the weekends. To a lot of guys that yeah, just we grew up in. in an area where you air, air where you worked on the car mm -hmm. and you changed tires yeah. or you went over the wall. You Multi, know, multitasking. Multitasking. And you usually yeah. worked on the whole car. You weren't just working on one component. Yeah, the, the, I told him the only thing that I never did on the car was paint. I never did yeah. paint and body, yeah. but I did fabricating. I did uh, fuel cells. Um, at at one race, I was able to get twenty three gallons in a twenty two gallon cell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lance said. Lance told Craig, he's like, "Shut that fuel pump off before Maddie gets me a fifty thousand dollar fine." <laughs> yeah, yes. but I, I, that whole family aspect of it was was the thing that w that mattered the most. And I don't mean just like you know it being a family sport and you can take your kids and all that stuff. But everybody in the garage was a was we were a bunch of traveling gypsies. Oh yeah, we were super tight. You know you. I kind of hope that whenever I'd be at out at the shopping center or something like that, if I if I ran into another crew member, they would have their sponsorship on because it was really you. You always correlated that person with what yeah. team they were on, right? What, what was really weird is like if you were out in public on a Tuesday or Wednesday and you saw someone that you would normally walk by at the garage and not say anything, it was it was odd to see them in public. You'd be like, "Hey, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, what's up, man? How's it yeah, going? You work in my office on the weekends. Yeah, exactly right." Mm -hmm. No, but I and I attribute that uh, that whole family thing to helping me get through a really hard time, and that was uh, let's see here. So I I got out of racing in in uh, halfway through 2012, and I think it was a godsend again because in 2014 my oldest son Elijah got diagnosed with a very 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 rare form of cancer called epithelial sarcoma, and immediately when that happened. Um, I got, I got messages from Lance and of course, Craig and Lisa, but Doc Petty, he called me and left a voicemail and, and asked me to, uh, to give him a call. And Doc Petty was instrumental in actually getting the surgical team lined up for Elijah's surgery that was going to take place months later. Um, Martin Truex and Sherry reached out, of course, and, um, and then I thought I think what was really cool, and Krista Voda as well. She they they all brought a bunch of notoriety or or, or awareness to what was going on because Elijah's cancer. There was only 500 cases since 1970, mm. you know, and he was the first kid to ever get it. He was nine when he was diagnosed, um, and he was one month shy of his 11th birthday when he passed away. Um, but in those waning months, you know, he got to do the uh, the Mar uh, Martin Truex's uh, catwalk for a cure. 
you know, he got to do that. And mm-hmm. he's got, there's a famous picture of him in red pants and he had red hair and he was, you know, throwing up the peace signs. Um, and then, um, he got to do that. He got to, um, Cam Newton crashed his Halloween party. <laughs> if you Googled, if you Googled Cam Newton and Elijah, you'll see pictures there. Elijah's the one that's got uh, Joker makeup on, but, uh, Cam, Cam, crashed the party and brought a bunch of snacks in one of those like open uh up in smoke ice cream wagons yeah and he brought colin cole who was the defensive tackle at the time so those guys crashed his party titus o'neill in the wwe showed up mm. you're a big wrestling fan ain't you oh yeah i like wrestling so is yeah. brett troutman wrestling yeah wrestling and racing was in charlotte when i was growing up that was it and then um i want to say going into homestead that year Joey Logano, Brad Kozlowski, and Martin all had Elijah's names, all, all had Elijah's name on their door tops. And that was before people were changing their names on the door tops. You know, uh, Kyle started doing Rowdy, but nobody else's names were on the door top. So Elijah got hit to have his name on there, which was really cool. Um, like I said, Chris Devota, Molly Grantham down at WCNC, or no, wait, she's WSOC news station. He was uh, one of her kids. Yeah. He got to make kids. a wish. But everybody had a prayers for Elijah or get well Elijah um, banner. A lot of the teams got together over at Stuart Haas Racing. Mm -hmm. They all, you know, they took company pictures with, you know, get well Elijah, that kind of thing. Um, How many races did he go to? You know what? He got, I took him, like, I got this picture here. He got to go uh, to a race when he was an infant. I took him when I was, let's see here. Does this work? Yeah. Um, Let me turn, let me switch it. Yeah. Here you go. There we go. But, um, I got to take him to a race when he was a was a was a wee little uh, infant toddler, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't spook him out, didn't scare him, nothing like that. Um, he went to he got to fly down on Ryan Newman's plane and go to Talladega in uh, in 2015. So everybody got to see him there with his bright red hair, and he colored his hair in multiple colors because his chemo made his hair turn gray, and he was freaked out about being a fourth grader with gray hair. So I told him, I'm like, dude, they sell dye at the store every day. So we can die back brown. We can die back brown now. Yeah. And he never went back to his natural color. It was blue one time. It was green. It was yellow. It was yellow with orange tips. It was red. It was purple. And the kid was just cool. And uh, he was he was a lot like myself as far as like um, his his body mold. But also, um, both my boys have got big time determination. And every time we ran into a roadblock with his treatments. He just shrug his shoulders and go, "Okay, what's next? What are we doing now? What do we got?" Mm-hmm. You know, I remember when me and the two boys would go to, um, I think it was either, I think it was either so- uh, soccer practice or maybe it was baseball or whatever. We would walk behind all these other dads, and I'd go, "All right, boys, what's second place?" And they would bolt around, first loser, dad." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, exactly right. But um, <laughs> everybody. And I can still talk to anybody in racing right now, even though I've been out for going on, you know, eight and a half years, nine years coming up. Yeah, I miss that. I miss all of them, but I can still reach out to all of them. And they still ask, you know, how's it going? You know, how you doing? Yeah. You know, you know, and we'll talk about Elijah. And, and really the the biggest therapy for me is just is talking about him and telling stories about him, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. I was we had a rule on the road before Elijah got sick that none of the team, none of my teammates were allowed to tell any of my stories until the boys were at least 15. But because of these extenuating circumstances, Craig decided, Craig Smokes had decided that, that he could tell a story to Elijah who was 10 at the time. And it was about me getting absolutely hammered in Memphis on two pitchers of beer and puking in front of every single team member in the entire garage in that big open gravel pit. You know, when you walk in the back straight away and it's no, there's yeah, nothing out there except yeah. like one of those, I don't know, telephone poles or whatever. Yeah. And I threw up everywhere. Oh, yeah. And he's, he told Elijah that story. Nice. Yeah, that, what, are, what are buddies for, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Those are your buddies yes. right there, man. Yeah. Those are your buddies right there. Yeah. Um, I brought in and this other thing too. This is the first time I was ever in the Winston Cup scene. And guess who took the picture? Coincidentally, Phil Cavalli took this picture. Did you know that Boy, Phil took it? Back in the day, I, I was mean, twenty-two I, when, when you took this. Yeah, just that was twenty-two. Nineteen ninety-nine. Ninety-nine. Yeah, hmm. twenty-two years ago. Yeah, man, the good old days. So, did you? Know, I guess you knew Phil was going to be here probably too. Yeah, right? and you saw, yeah, because you can yeah. see it in the bottom of the picture. It says Phil Cavalli. I watch your show. 
Good. I'm glad you do. I listen to this. I like it's, 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 it's a, <laughs> no, what I find fun is, is listening to the older racers. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, like what was it? Larry Pollard. Yeah. He was in, I love to listen to, I mean, that aspect of, of taking a car on an open trailer in a suburban, right. that's mm -hmm. legit. Yeah. yeah. Sure <laughs> that's is. how stock car racing was back in the day. Yeah. You know, I remember being mm -hmm. at Charlotte for the very first ARCA race that I was ever in and there was an open wheel trailer with a with an ARCA car on it and they had Washington State tags. I'm like, are you kidding me? You you brought up like it was basically a Winston West car. Right. And they brought that all the way across the country just to yeah, race in Charlotte. Sure. And they did. They made the show and, and 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 they had a rack of tires across the hood, you know. I remember in the old days at Daytona when old the Zero car, the master host sponsored Delma Cowart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> would show up. He'd roll in and yes. just before the qualifiers, you know, to unload mm -hmm. it off the back of the flatbed and roll it on out and push it out on the pit road and go qualify. What was Bergdahl's <laughs> first name? That. Do you remember? What was Bergdahl's first name? Was it Bill? Or was it? Um, he was Bill? a driver. Bill. Am I thinking Bergdahl? Is that, is that the right name? Phil, uh, no, Phil Bonifield. Phil okay, Bonifield. okay, Bonifield. Yeah, I'm sorry. big guy. Yes. yes. <laughs> we were at Dover, and he sent somebody down to our pit and asked us if we needed a caution. Because he was going to chunk something out the window right. <laughs> to get a caution uh, well, for us. And that's what used to happen back in the day, pretty mm -hmm. regular. <laughs> You'd have a piece of roll bar padding or something with yeah. that chrome tape wrapped all around it. Yeah, or a drink. Toss it out the window. Yeah, or, yeah or a drink bottle. Do I got time to tell one more Dave Marcus story? Absolutely, because we had some questions as well. Okay, what's the question? Do well, that real quick. One was, of course, from Beer Man. He's asking the, the one we usually ask, which is about the Sterling Marlin story. He said, where's the Sterling Marlin story? And then what would Matt change about NASCARs from Rachel? And Dave says, used to be the transporter driver was also the gas man. That was pretty much regular. That was Yeah, that's true. Yep, and then Rachel, what did Matt like to do the most in working on the car? All right, so I guess what I would change now, um, gosh, this, the, the car tomorrow just changed so many things. But this, this whole stage racing thing, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of that. There was so much changed after Bill France Sr. passed away and Dale Sr. passed away. I mean, it was sure. just like the whole the whole thing just got flipped up on its on its end. And the fact that we are away from our racing roots, like Wilkesboro and Rockingham, mm -hmm. those places, those it's not a, those weren't cookie cutter racetracks. What was your favorite racetrack? Mine was Richmond, Bristol, Bristol. Most mm -hmm. people say Bristol. Mm -hmm. Most people say Bristol. But do you remember yeah. when that place was sold out three years in advance? Oh, yeah. I remember when you couldn't get a spot. At, even like a track like Dover, when I was at the scene, I'd have to put a photographer in, up in the corner of the grandstands in turn three. Farthest corner you could get, and you still had to ask people if he could stand there. Right. I mean, Just to like reserve, seen, reserve your spot. He, well, yeah. He didn't have a seat, but he was a photographer, so he had to kind of stand in the the walkway up in the corner out of people's ways, but there was no standing room at all. It was just, or there were no available seats back then. Yeah. As, as far as I remember, I can't remember any races that were actually not sold out, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands. Right, right, I think sure. the only one that was, that might've been that might've been Fontana. And that was because the very first race there right. was like, it was like hubba baloo and you know, wow, yeah. we have a racetrack and you know, and, and it had worn off, you know, this yep. California people are fickle. Well, yeah, and, they always, even from the beginning, they'd come out and watch the beginning of the race, and pre-race would be covered with all these movie stars, and then after about 20, 30 laps, people yeah. would start to filter out. Yep. They would be gone. They didn't stick around very long. No, but every I, place was sold out, man. I mean, yeah. Dover and New Hampshire yeah. and, um, yeah. you know, Pocono even, you know. Yeah. And yeah, I've uh, got pictures of me there, like even one standing in front of the stands at Charlotte and Indy. And it's like you couldn't see an empty spot in the seats at all. Anywhere. Well, the thing about this, Charlotte, when I moved here, Turn two was nothing. And then they built right. the Diamond Terrace there. And I don't remember how many thousands more fans it fit, yeah. but it was sold out. Yeah. You know? And yeah. now they tore it down and now it's a motorhome. I know, it's crazy. And in, in, in the back stretch, we had the concrete bleachers. You could sit up there. Um, and turn four, you know, I always had the Humpty Dumpty bumpy corner and, and stuff. Um, I, I think that would. Um, yeah, I, I would love to go r back racing at Rockingham in Wilkesboro. You know, in smaller places just like that. I think Iowa Speedway would be a great place to race. It's just like Richmond. Sure. It's a seven eighths 
Seven eighths well, double dog. Yeah, leg. That, that's a unique. I'm surprised NASCAR has not went there for a cup event because that's a unique track. I mean, instead of like doing all these rovals and know. all this other yeah. other crap, or you know. Yeah, I'm not really sure. About I'm not all against that road myself, course racing. Yeah. I, I like it because it, it does it does bring out the driver right. in, in in guys that are used mm-hmm. to going in circles. Yeah. But go to a place like that, you know, change yeah. it up a little bit. Well, speaking of that, Dawson Cram, 14th. Is that right? Uh, 17th, 17th. He finished this past weekend. Yeah. That's his we first really time on well. a road course. Ever in a, ever in any kind of vehicle. Yeah. Never been on a road course. Yeah. Um, another one was, um, you know, if you sent the cup guys to a place like gateway, that tight yeah, paper clip, that sure, is, that is a very, sure. that's a long flat tight corner place. You know, mm-hmm. they call it a paper clip cause it looks like one. You know, that would like, add a, a... I just remember how hot and humid it used to be at that track. So bad. Oh, yes. turn, do you remember when turn two was breaking up because oh, the, yeah. the heat was so intense oh, and the cars were, were going through there that's, and the asphalt was just like you know, giving up? That's the hottest you know. I've ever been. And I and I was totally shocked by it, too. Yeah. You know, all those that's rivers real. converged there. That's why. And they'd had the... Oh. The race was in July, wasn't it? Yep. So it, was it was in July. July. Brutal. Absolutely. And uh, what was their second question that you asked? Uh, what well, was my favorite part? I'm working on car. Yeah. I absolutely love changing tires. That is my favorite thing to do. I always, um, right before the race would start, I would go and get in my fire suit. I would have, I would eat, but I wouldn't eat big because I didn't want to throw up. I always, I, I had butterflies. No matter what year it was, I always had butterflies because I just got so excited. So I would eat something small. Um, I always prehydrated so I wouldn't have to worry about dehydrating during the race. Because the only thing that's showing as far as skin is concerned is just around your eyeballs. Yeah. Everything else is covered up, so you're really, really hot, especially in Darlington on Labor Day weekend. Oh, my God. But I love changing tires. I love that competition aspect of it. I always put my music in in my ears before the race started and just kind of got in a zone. And everybody knew that I wasn't going to respond to you if you told me I have a good race or, or tap me on the shoulder or whatever because I was just in that zone. Um, and I loved just getting in that zone, you know, and just – and just waiting for that. But as far as working on the car, um, man, I, I started working on fuel uh, rear end housings when I first started at, at uh, Ricky's and then I moved to fuel cells and then I did all the, all the, all the liquid lines on it. Mm-hmm. And then I moved to the front suspension area and that gets pretty hot too at short tracks, working above all the brakes and all that stuff. But so much depends on the front end of the car. And I'm not saying it's any less than the, the rear end of the car, you know, but you have a lot of force that's going up there. So you really have to make sure that your bolts and nuts are tight. Sure. Yeah. Um, and everything is where it needs to be. Um, Tommy says there's uh, Rockingham has a race scheduled this year. Do they? How about What's, that? What series is it? Do you know? I'm wondering the same thing. And uh, Mark James says, I really like North Wilkesboro. So, and J- Jody Lynn Brooke, Jody Brooke, she says, I thoroughly enjoyed the show. Lots of laughs, fun stories, good times. Thanks for the sharing, Matt, Dave, and Phil. Thank you, Wayne and Janine at Jersey Cape Yachts. Thanks for listening. Good night for all you. Stay safe. And then a question for Matt from Dave Ellis. Okay. He, he's down in there, you know, J.D. in the breeze. He says, I'm down in Yarborough, Pearson country. Uh, when you guys first started, was there a – distracting wow factor about being around these type of guys was it business as usual i can answer that absolutely was there was uh, every time i saw david pearson every That's, time i saw kel yarborough when i saw the older wow. guys that had gotten out of the garage before i got Smoky in the ro- lodge like like both uh bobby and donnie allison yeah i got to meet and talk with them and donnie actually helped us test with ricky a lot so mm-hmm. i actually got to hear a lot of stories straight from donnie's mouth um, seeing Kale Yarbrough walk around. I remember we were at the Coke 600 in 2007. And at that time, you know, that's when pit crews were being recruited. You know, they were former athletes at, at a college that they didn't either, they either got let go or didn't make it right. or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I just remember that standing there at the back of the hauler and I just looked out there and I said, holy crap, it's a silver fox. And one of those crew members there that didn't wasn't vested in racing, wasn't a racer, was just there to be the athlete, was just like, what's a silver fox? And I went, oh, my God, mm-hmm, yeah. are you kidding me? I and know. he's like, he goes, so, no, no, educate me. And I said, listen, I said, David Pearson didn't even run a full schedule, but out of out of uh, him and Richard Petty's 200 win, out of Richard Petty's 200 wins, mm-hmm. him and David Pearson finished one, two, 67 times. Yeah, how about that? And he didn't even run and, a full schedule. And he, yeah, and he had a better winning record than Rich Petty, actually, if you go by percentages. If you go by percentages, yeah, absolutely. So imagine if he would have run a full schedule. That's right. But, but don't you forget what Donnie Allison said. Oh, yeah. He Richard did. Petty won seven day total of 500s, but Donnie gave him three. Yeah, he, did. he said he, he said his winning percentages was, yeah, were actually he was better. Yeah, 
He so, had right. much better percentages. Because he won 10 races. And, uh, and, and think about what they were doing. They were doing that on bias play tires with a car that would sit seven or eight people. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I know, right? That's what I was thinking. You know what I'm talking about? Like the Roadrunners yeah. and, and those big yeah. Impalas and yeah. all that? You know, can, I mean, can you imagine how much? Yeah. With a bucket seat. <laughs> right, or a bench seat. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Mean, and go, yeah. Back to Bill, go back to Bill Elliott's you know, yeah. qualifying run of 215, blah, 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 blah. He mm-hmm. did it in a box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. It was, a, it was a Ford yeah. Thunderbird yeah. in 1985. Oh. Hey, I, I, I look at photos now from the 90s and 80s that I took, and the cars got this much clearance under the front valance. <laughs> I mean, there was yeah, no aerodynamics. <laughs> all right, yeah. They weren't sealed at all. Yeah. No. And I remember uh, that first year down in Daytona with Dave, you know, I couldn't believe that the fender stuck out so much that you could set a drink on the rear quarter panel, you know? And the, and the, and the spoiler was only, what, what, four or five inches tall? I think it was yeah, four inches, wasn't yeah. it? It was a little bitty yeah. thing, you know? And when the cars would come in, the the... The whole back end was down on the ground, super low. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You had spring rubbers. You could pull them out during the race, all kinds of things that would – all kinds of stuff. So, R.D. Ford's up in New Hampshire. Thank you, Matt, for being on Racing Groups with Ham. Hey, I'll tell you what. I, in New Hampshire is where I got my nickname, Matty. Matty. Well, it's – Yeah. They, everybody called me Matty, but because, you know, up there where they packed their cars. Yes. Some friends of mine up there that lived at the very, very bottom of uh, Lake Winnipesaukee, they <laughs> called me, hey, Matty, we're having a party at my father's house. <laughs> and so we went there, and that was the first time I ever had moose steaks. Uh, I'd never had moose, moose before. Oh, I didn't know you could eat moose. No, but because they hung out a lot, they're all they always said, like, hey, Matty. So then everybody started calling me Matty. Matty. <laughs> yeah, y'all don't forget to hit the subscribe because every Monday night at 7 o'clock, have a new guest and so oh, they, tell, they tell their racing routes my brother just reminded me of a of a, a dale earnhardt and a dave marcus story all in one yeah phil do you remember the uh, darlington race where there was gosh i want to say there was like six or seven rain delays in a row in 99 and it's like the it would we went green and then it started rain we went yellow then red they dried the track off Went racing again, rained again. It was just, it, 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 was, it was like Florida, yep. you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it just, and that happened over and over and over again. Yeah. Well, Dave comes on the radio and he goes, he goes, I don't believe these guys want to finish this race and this old man's getting hungry. What do we got there in the pits to eat? And uh, we're like, well, what do you want? He goes, I'll tell you what. He goes, when I come in for a pit stop, he goes, I want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He goes, I'd like to have a cup of Pepsi, not in a can. I want it in a Gatorade cup. And um, I want a... <laughs> I want a slice. Uh, I want a slice of watermelon, and I want four of those cookies that Matt's got in his backpack. <laughs> Your cookies. <laughs> and wow. they, and and yeah. Bob Marcus was the crew chief, and he looks down at me. He goes, "He goes, you got your backpack?" And I'm like, "Yeah, it's right here." Somebody get a PBJ quick. So um, he comes in, and um, our spotter comes. All right, four tires, two cans, a sandwich, a cup of Pepsi in a cup, not a can. Four cookies and a we- and a wedge of watermelon. Is uh is the drive through open? Yeah. And so Dave comes in there. We have a good pit stop, and then we spend the next three minutes handing them all this stuff while the cars are going around the racetrack, right? Yep. And um, once Dave gets all settled in, he puts it in gear, <laughs> takes off. We're put it on the back stretch because at that time we had pits on the back stretch. He goes up there, and and of course now we're dead last in a double file restart, dead last. But they haven't called the green yet. And um, so pace car's still out. Buster's out. They're still in the pace car. And Dave just decides, oh, well, when he left the pits, I, um, I got to backtrack. When he left the pits, he swerves into the 43 pits, just swerves, and holds the watermelon out the driver's side window up at the king and telling him number <laughs> one with the watermelon wedge in his uh. hand. So Richard Petty comes down to the pits. I'm scraping tires. Yeah. And he goes, he has that giant smile and he goes, Hey, you guys got any more watermelon on the truck? And I said, yeah. and I look at, uh, uh, I look uh, at Richard Petty. I go, yeah, it's in the holler. And I just point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he goes, thanks. And he goes, and I'm guessing he got a piece of watermelon. Oh. Well then Dave <laughs> and funny. in the double reef, I'll start before yeah. this thing goes green. He weaves his way up in between both rows of cars and all the spotters like 71 car coming up in the middle, 71 car coming up. Not, not sure what he's doing. Everybody is everybody is scattering. And it looks like Moses has parted the sea for yeah. our car coming up into the middle of the of the pack of cars. He gets he gets up right next to the three. The three is on the outside lane. We're in the middle now. And he looks over at Dale and holds the watermelon up with the number one sign up again. 
out the passenger window. Oh gosh. And then and then fades back and gets all the way back in the back oh, of the line. Oh man. Well then, what was his uh, tuner's name and uh, builder and uh, Danny Lawrence? Danny yeah. Lawrence, yeah. Yeah, he comes walking over and he's like, he goes, hey. Dale wants to know if you guys got any more watermelon. Oh, my gosh. That is <laughs> such a good story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this stuff really happens in racing? Yeah, it does. Especially with buds like them. Hey, let's spin the wheel right quick. So who's going to be our winner? Who's going to win the prizes? Well, it depends on the color. Yeah. Purple. That'd be Barney. That would be Dickie Dennis. Right. Has he already won once, or does it need to be present no. to win? No, he hasn't won yet. He ha- he hasn't won this uh, the prize will prize yet. So we'll get you something out there, Dickie Dennis. I uh, already have your address. I'm pretty sure of that. I want to tell uh, Keith Gant out at Firefly Balloons. Hello, also Brooke Widener, the elderberry syrup lady, and also Tiffany Acosta. Who okay, is with her. I thought I yep. saw it earlier. Brooke is the elderberry syrup lady over there on Front Street. If you haven't been to her yeah. storefront, mm-hmm. go check it out. I want to say hey, howdy to Darren Holt down there at Red Buffalo Brewing Company, home of Chill Billy Ale. What's up, Darren? Tia Case is back home in Iowa. Hope you're nice and warm. Um, Jeff Lorsong is up in Prior Lake, Minnesota. Frosty's listening over in Kannapolis. Um, and my parents, of course, my brother. So thank you so much for reminding me of the stories, by the way, Chris. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. Uh, Dave uh, Ellis again was asking a question about Robert Presley. I thought I saw someone else ask that. Brett Troutman asked that earlier. Robert Presley from Asheville in the Jasper Ford. Yes. And I was trying to find what he was actually asking. You see it on their computer there, Phil? No, my computer died out. <laughs> oh, the battery went out. I remember yeah. when uh, you could go to any of the, the industrial parks and it was all race teams. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you could and, and if you lost your job, you could actually just push your toolbox across the parking lot yeah. and have another job. Yeah. And that's one thing. Dave was like, how many teams have you worked for? And I'm just like, well, in that whole span of racing, only five. I only had five uniforms that whole time. But I knew guys that had five uniforms in a year. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, do you remember the dude, the tire guy, the dude? He had a he had a tool belt across here that had all of his tire equipment. He was really really tall. Back in the late nineties, no, he drove a Monte Carlo with an actual spoiler on it. Anyway, his name was the dude, and his first name was James. I don't remember what what his last name was, but he worked hmm. at Jasper. Yeah. He worked everywhere. Uh, yeah. Was well, he five from uniforms Austin? in a year, man? Yeah. Wow. Not even kidding. Yeah. Every time no. I think of Jasper, I think about. Um, Goodness, the guy, the the guy that was the Jack Man, John Callis is bro, his son. I'm sorry, and he was from Australia. G'day, mate. Yes, exactly. And he moved back. And to that Australia. g'day mate actually fits. Yeah. Well, oh, wait a minute. What do you mean? I'm quarter Australian. My dad was made in Australia and shipped over here in a container. Yeah. Yes. The container was my grandmother's belly. Oh. Good gracious, man! I'm about to throw up in my mouth. <laughs> hold on, hold on. That's a Hallmark card. I'm going to write that down. Uh, yeah. So does yes. that mean I'm, does that mean I'm part bowling alley? Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> Do want to give a shout out. Got a shout yes. out for uh, Timmy and Lucy Hill, our NASCAR driver, right. Timmy Hill. Yes. They had their first child Friday the 19th. That's oh. Hudson Grant Hill. Best job ever. Six pounds, 14 ounces, and we all know how tall Timmy is. So that baby was born four foot eight tall. No, 20 inch baby. Yeah, so congratulations cool. there. Yeah, congratulations to y'all. And uh, Bob Tracy. Still, yeah. uh, he's recuperating. I saw him the other night. He's doing really well, recuperating well, and on the mend. Yeah, he's in good hands. His girl Danny will take care of him. Isn't it? What's the name of his? Uh, is it Dirty Boys? Dirty Boys. Yeah, yeah right in Mooresville. If you got any pressure washing or yeah. detailing jobs or anything, all oh, Dirty Boys. They're in the book. That's right. I hope everybody loved the stories. Yes. Oh yeah, we got a lot of comments on the stories. So yeah. awesome show, Mark James. Says. I think you should come back for another time for to, for to go on more stories like the yeah. behind the scenes stuff. That's what the fans really like right. to hear. Yeah, it's yeah, so easy yeah. when um, when it comes to that. I mean, there's a yeah. there's a lot of stuff that you, that oh. we didn't touch on, but it's like the one thing I, I figured out, or maybe I haven't figured it out yet, is that you just when you're in it and you're doing it, you don't realize how cool it is in the moment. But at the same mm-hmm. time, you could look at it and you go. Does this really happen? This is what professional yeah. racing is about. You know, and some of the things that we did, it's like, what in the yeah. hell are right. we doing here? Yeah. You know, and it's like fans would never, ever believe you if you told them. Mm-hmm. All they see is what they see on television, mm-hmm. you know, or or what they might see on, on shows and, and that kind of thing. But it's like, yeah, this stuff really happens. Yeah. They don't have a clue. I mean, for me, my job was 10 times easier, 100 times easier than yours. 
I mean, I'm able to slip in and out of the media center as a photographer and lax off, but you guys, man, you work terrible hours in the shops. Well, Especially listen, when you're working for somebody like Marcus, you either worked 18 hours a day or you, he's going to get somebody else that's ready and willing to do it. Your job is not without danger, though. What was the name of the photographer that got his collarbone and shoulder broke, or maybe his arm broke, when Blake Feast blew through our pits? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. There's I, a six-second clip on YouTube. If you typed in yeah. Blake Feast crashes, yeah. there's a six-second clip. He hit that clip. barrier. Yeah. Well, here's yeah. the deal. Our pit road... Our pit board sign mm -hmm. was an engine. Well, it blended in with everything behind it, and Blake didn't see it. So he came into our pit at 55 miles an hour, oh, wow. and I had already shifted my weight to go out there to change the tire. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I as soon as I shifted my weight and I saw he wasn't slowing down, I went, oh, crap. And I, and I knew that I had to push off really hard, and as soon as I hit the ground, to run as fast as I could to get away from there. And my tire carrier got both, both his legs broke. Oh, wow. Jeez. You remember Opie, Ben Fishbeck? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, that took him out for the, our, the beginning of that wow. season, and he didn't get to come back until, I think, Texas in the fall. <laughs> but Blake just blew right through us, and I can't remember yeah. the photographer's uh, name. Uh, it might have been. Was it Steve Rose? Yes, it was Steve. It was Steve Rose. It was Steve Rose. Yeah. And, and Blake I didn't realize know Steve. Right yeah, I know Steve. I didn't realize he had, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that he had – gotten hurt like that dude oh, you, you uh, gotta check it out yeah. if you want you want to have fun i mean it's the video on youtube only has six seconds but type it's in like blake, a cue ball he's blake, like a cue ball yeah. when he hit that wall gosh blake feet and we hit the jersey barrier yeah but you can see my tire carrier go up in the air you can see me run out and it rips the gun and the hose out of my hands and it was mm -hmm. it was like oh my gosh it wow. was it was crazy he he I just barely missed the right front headlight, and he yeah. went flying by me at 55 mm -hmm. miles an hour with the brakes locked up. It was just crazy, but I felt bad for Steve because, man, he took the brunt because he was he was like, I'm going to film these guys, you know. I'm going to take pictures of these guys changing tires. Mm -hmm. Took one for the for the team. I, hit an, really I think it hit team, an official, too. I mean, there was like mm -hmm. four or five people that got hit right yeah. there. We had all kinds of different pit signs. I mean, we even had a mirror one time trying to where you know stand out and be seen to where the driver could see it. And then we got it on pit wall and tape our number on pit wall. Oh, Which, you know, another thing, one of my favorite tracks was Milwaukee Mile. Oh, the food. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because it always happened during Summerfest. Yeah. So if you weren't at the racetrack, you could always go downtown. That's where they held the state fair. Yep. So yeah. Blues there Traveler was, was there the one year, the first year I went there. That was fantastic. But I always loved going to the Milwaukee Mile. I mean, yeah. it was it was easy for a lot of my family to come over and, and, and go. Yeah. But it was a great sure. race, too, though. And they had the fried cheese curds. Yes. Anything cheese. Oh, Anything oh, cheese. Oh, That's right. Uh, all right, so I guess we better wrap it up. We officially have gone over the record. The longest, yes. So Doug Yates held that record before. Now you just blew it out of the water, actually. About 30 minutes or so. But this is only but part okay. one. Part one, but, you got to come back. Yeah, you have, definitely have to come back. I think but, what I'd like to do is, is figure out a way to bring Craig and Lisa and oh, Howard. Yeah. Howard. Oh. <laughs> Howard is still rocking the mullet. Oh God! Well, you know, that eventually that's what we're going to have to do. Start just bringing in several people at a time, yeah. two or three, four. Well, people. what I would do, what I would say is, if you did it and you could bring in like a core group of people that were with each other for such a long time. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's then they just idea. feed off of each other, and you can just sit back oh. and just listen to the the crap show happen. What I told yes. David I want to do is get four wives in here, and I've oh, already got no. them lined up: Carla right. Wallace, Debbie Musgrave, and the Delaire sister Diane and Donna Bodine Richardson. Oh. It'd be like a. I'll just, I'll just sit back. <laughs> yeah, I'll just sit back and you know, four uh, women. You better get a food sponsor by then, yeah. so that way everybody can have something to eat and drink, yeah. maybe. Well, I mentioned, and I'm not saying uh, because women eat a lot. I'm not yeah. saying that at all. Right, right. But they do. And, sure. and wine, probably. Oh yeah, lots of wine. Wine sponsor. We'll get one of them box wines here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. So thanks everybody so much for tuning in, and I'm gonna play the uh, actual intro again. I started doing it an outro. And I've got about three quarters of the way through it. Thanks for everybody listening. And to everybody that uh, I'm friends and family with, love you all. And thank you so much for checking it out. And hope you learned a little bit about the, the journey that I took to get to this point. Yeah, that's right. And if you all have any more comments, questions for Matt, you can go back on here after the video ends and you can ask those questions or make those comments or whatever you want to do. And also the, the live feed, the real-time comments <coughs> will stay on here as well i finally figured out if i don't go back and edit the video the comments stay on there so you can go back and read all these comments because there's a lot of them on here we didn't get to but thanks everybody for the comments and uh as i mentioned go back on and 
Good night, and we'll see y'all next uh, Monday. Actually, next Monday I'm going to have most likely Eddie Yount is going to be in with me, who was in, and he's got a lot of racing stories from back in the day. He worked uh, with Richard Bostick, and he was around uh, back in the six, 70s and 80s in those days. And he still works. He works at Gibbs right now, so he'll be on with me next Monday. So Very cool. it should be a good show. So. Uh, everybody have a great week and uh, tune in to Chad Hutter will be racing tomorrow evening in the E Motorsports Series for uh, can- Canadian Canadian or whatever. Canada. Yeah, that's it. Canada. And hey, hey, he'll hey. tackle the Canadian up yonder. And if any of you are in the North Carolina area, March 14th is the season or opener at Caraway Speedway for the Smart Modified Division. I will be going there to watch Bobby Labonte race. He'll be senior. Bobby Labonte. Bobby Labonte? Yeah, Tyler's the son, but Bobby, no, Junior. Bobby Labonte, you know, our 2000 champion. <laughs> what did uh, Tommy he's say? He's still driving? Tour. Yeah, he's driving the modified tour. Yeah. Smart Tommy sent us a year. picture. He did? Yeah. I was, I was scared to look. And uh, it was something, uh, I forgot what he said it was, but um, anyway, uh, Chad Hyder's going to be riding and driving in the Canadian E Motorsports Drivers. Tackle the Canadian Tire Raceway tomorrow. Canadian Tire Raceway yep. tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. So you can tune in on. Canadian Eden Motorsports on the Facebooks, and that's the uh, D Ham I Am uh, Racing Roots with Ham Ford now. Nothing number smells th- like race fuel and burning tires. Number 37. <sighs> He's got those for his air fresheners. They go off automatically. Cologne. Yeah. <laughs> that's Me, good. I'm, I'm going to fight COVID by fighting the curve by being on water. Yes. Board my Jersey Cape, yeah. I contribute all the all the fumes and everything that we inhaled over the last how many years, plus the rum and my, whatever else. Oh to, yeah, uh, keeping it at bay. <laughs> right. Kobe Absolutely. comes up and it's like, "How about this guy?" Oh hell no, I'm out. <laughs> yes, and speaking of Jersey Cape yachts, you'll hear from them in just mere moments in this uh, opener closer. So everybody have a great week, and we'll see you next Monday. Yeah. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest. From the racing world with their stories, their paths, their their racing racing roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and their YouTube channel. Also on JerseyCapeYachts.com. Check out my website, dhamiam.com. Be sure to hit that.